Good morning. This is the Citrus County Planning and Development Commission public hearing for September 15, 2020. Would you be willing to do it? Sorry. Um, if you'd like to join <coughs> us at this time, I invite you to please stand for the invocation and remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. I'm sorry for that. Give me a heads up. Can't find it. Hang on. Sorry, we weren't prepared for this. Yep. <laughs> Dear Lord, please give us the grace to be understanding, patient, and tolerant. With these attributes, we can conduct our work in a manner which will be pleasing to thee, our county, and its residents. In the Lord's name, amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Sorry about that. <coughs> yeah. Good morning. May we have the roll call, please? Yes, sir. Good morning. Good morning. The following Planning and Development Commission members are present this morning. Robert Bass, Chair. Stacy Worthington, First Vice Chair. Richard Barnes. David Bramblett. Michael Facemeyer. Kurt Stone. And alternate Carol Scragg. Thank you. If any person decides to appeal any decision made by the commission with respect to any matter considered at this hearing, he or she will need a record of the proceeding and for such purpose, he or she may need to ensure that a verbatim record of the proceedings is made, which record includes testimony and evidence upon which the, the, the appeal is to be based. During public input portions of the meeting, individuals are given three minutes, representatives of an organization are given five minutes. When anyone wishing to speak comes to the podium, please complete a yellow form to hand to the recording secretary. Please print your name, address, and the number of the application for which you are speaking on the form. The yellow forms can be found at the podium by the door. If representing an organization, a letter of authorization must accompany the speaker. Comments will be limited to the topic being heard. Please state your name, spell your last name, and give your address for the tape record. At this time, <coughs> excuse me, anyone wishing to come forward and speak on any item other than the items on the agenda? Okay. Uh, we have no minutes to approve, and I think that moves us right on to staff announcements. All right, nice to see all of you again. I know August was a nice month off, but the rest of the year, no, <laughs> not going to happen. <laughs> Are you giving us a big heads up? <laughs> I am, I am. Um, just, just early, your next meeting on October 6th, we have four applications. Um, I will go ahead otherwise and go straight to um, ex parte communication in the absence of the county attorney. Has anyone had any ex parte communication on V2213 or PUD2204? The um, other items are workshops, so they are not quasi-judicial. We'll start with Mr. Barnes. Site visits on both. None. 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 Site visits, site visits on both. None. Site visits on both. Thank you, sir. Quite welcome. Uh, if the applicant <coughs> is present for the first one, and we also have an introduction by staff. Yes, sir. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Twenty-two thirteen. Daniel Malone. The applicant is requesting reduced right-of-way setbacks along North Pioneer Terrace and State Road 200 for a single-family mobile home. An aerial view of the subject property. A view looking north up North Pioneer Terrace. A view looking across North Pioneer Terrace to the west. A view looking south down North Pioneer Terrace. A view looking east towards the subject property and the State Road 200. A view looking northeast towards State Road 200. A view looking southeast towards State Road 200. And finally, a copy of the site plan submitted by the applicant. Thank you. Is the applicant present? Yes, if you'd like to please explain your request. Uh, yes, uh, I, I'd like to... Uh, and also, please state your name for the record, please. Uh, Daniel Malone. Thank you. Yes, uh, uh, the variance for this is uh, basically, you know, for a mobile home that I have purchased already from uh, uh, Sam's Mobile Home. And so they're working with me on, uh, you know, placing the mobile home on there. And it's basically the same size as, uh, as the one next door. 
so they just needed, I guess, the, this small variance to uh, approve, you know, from the county to uh, uh, to put the mobile home on there. It's this this would be my residence. So, um, you, you, it, I, I mean, that's basically where where I'm at with it. Uh, is there any other? information you'd need uh, not this time do we have any comments from staff no thank you sir any questions from Commission I have a couple very quick questions for you sir have you talked to anybody in health concerning the reuse of the septic system uh, well I was waiting for the approval and okay then, and then I was gonna have the septic uh, uh, okay inspected okay and then you have that existing concrete pad on the side of the property. Is that going to remain, as I understand the drawing? Uh, if, if, it would have, if it's approved, then it would be used as steps. As okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. All right. Good. Excuse me, sir. Sir? Yes. No, the gentleman with the phone? Yes. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Can we have a report from staff, please? Wing it today, Joe. <laughs> That's fine. I can do that. <clears throat> this application is being requested to allow for uh, reduced right of way setbacks on the subject property. Uh, the applicant is requesting a 10 foot setback from the property lines along both North Pioneer Terrace and State Road 200. The subject property is 0 0.07 acres in size, it's about 3,200 square feet, so it's fairly small. <clears throat> Here you can see the subject property and the concrete slab that's shown on the plan. There was a 606 square foot mobile home that was on this property prior to and it was removed in 2016. And that 80 square foot slab was part of the previous mobile home and it is still existing as you can see. So here's a view of the subject property to the north. And this is the subject property to the south. So you can see there are mobile homes fairly close to the right of way in this area. This is looking across State Road 200 at some of the non-residential uses. So the applicant is requesting an 840 square foot single family dwelling, mobile home. And they, they are requesting reduced right away setbacks. The 10 foot on either side, as you can see here, is about 35 feet from the center line of Pioneer Terrace, where 50 feet is what's required by the code. And it would be a 60 foot center line setback from State Road 200, where 125 feet is what is required. However, if you look at the subject area and the front average setbacks, the front average setback from Pioneer is 12 feet, and the front average setback from State Road 200 is about 28 feet. So that leaves an available building envelope of about 1,179 square feet. And so, there we go. And so because there is a buildable envelope for the subject property, uh, not all the findings have been found to be positive. And we did receive one public input yesterday. It should be in your packet. Thank you. Any questions of Joe from the commission? Um, I have a question. Yes, Commissioner Stone. Joe, what did you say the average setback was of the rest of the neighborhood from uh, the center line of State Road 200? From, and I took it from the property line, not the center line. Okay. But the setback, the front average setback along State Road 200 was 28 feet. 28 feet, and, and this would have uh, 60 foot? 
Right. Uh, right. Well, this would be 10 feet as proposed. 10 foot. Yes, from the property the blue, line. The blue there is the 28 feet. That's the average. Oh, I and see. And the red is what he's asking for. I see. Yes. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? I have a question. Joe, um, do we know when um, State Road 200 is supposed to be widened at all? I do not know that. Okay. However, staff did talk to um, FDOT. Yes, you'll see in the staff report, engineering wanted some input from DOT regarding this since they are requesting a reduced right away setback on 200. We did reach out to DOT on behalf of the applicant and they told us that since this is not within their right of way, they had no jurisdiction, they had no comment. Okay. So, and they didn't give us any kind of time frame for when they're gonna be widening. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Joe. The public portion of the meeting will now be open. If there is anyone present in favor of the application who would like to speak, please come forward to the podium. As a reminder, individuals have three minutes to speak and organizations have five minutes. When <coughs> speaking on this application, please address the board. If you have any documentation that you want to be entered into the record, please provide a copy to the recording secretary. Is there anyone wishing to speak in favor? Anyone wishing to speak in favor? I do, but I didn't feel safe. I didn't. You can do it after Part? Yes. yes. She didn't fill out a paper yet. Yes, that's fine, but you need, you need to fill out the yellow form and submit it to the recording secretary. A afterwards. Afterwards is fine. Just. My name is Joanne Perella, and I live um, on uh, Pioneer Terrace. I have a home there, and I'm welcoming uh, uh, Dan into the neighborhood. It's a very nice little neighborhood, and, and a lot of elderly people live there. And uh, I'm sure he would love to have a home there, as he's staying in a camper trailer right now. So it's always nice to have new people come into the neighborhood. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in favor of the application? Anyone wishing to speak in favor? Anyone wishing to speak in favor? Seeing none, if there is anyone present opposed to the application would like to speak, please come forward to the podium. Anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Anyone wishing to speak in opposition? <coughs> anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Seeing none, we'll close the public portion <coughs> of the meeting and return it to the board for action. Any comments, concerns, motions? Mr. Mr. Chairman, I, I think this is a it's a reasonable request. Uh, I am concerned about the setback from State Route 200. Um, Mr. Chair, yeah. oh, I'm sorry, are you done? Uh, yeah, and ba <laughs> that's basically it. I was searching for the next sentence that wasn't coming. And it so. just kind of like <laughs> flew away, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Worthington. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I, too, agree with Mr. Facemeyer. Um, I think the issue is here. The gentleman is trying to fit the new, the new home in between the existing septic and existing concrete pad. He's already purchased the home. I have no issue with the setback on North Pioneer Terrace. I am concerned about the one on State Road 200 as well. So I'm looking forward to hear what the rest of the board has to say. Okay. Anyone else wishing to offer some thoughts? Yeah, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. I, I don't agree with the uh, setback concerns that my colleagues have. I live in the area. I see the, uh, the setbacks along the State Road 200. I'm very familiar with the FDOT uh, expansion coming down 200 because of the properties that, that me and my wife own. Um, I'm in favor for this application to move. I think uh, the home that sat there on his property back in 2006 was an eyesore to the community. And I think this would be a pleasant uh, welcoming to, uh, to that area. So I'm, I'm in favor of this application. Anyone? Yes, Commissioner Straggs. Uh, I'm in favor. Okay. Anyone else wishing to speak yeah, on this? My, my concern is just from a safety perspective, you know, who knows when that highway would be widened, probably not in my lifetime. Um, so I'm just, safety was my concern. Yes. Um, 
I, I have a concern with the right of way issue also. Um, I would hate to see the, this home be built and then um, FDOT come through and need to do additional right of ways and then we end up having them purchase out this property uh, and after the gentleman has just put a brand new home on there. Uh, based on what Joe has shown us, there certainly appears to be a buildable area that he could put a slightly different style home on there. Uh, he did indicate that he, he bought the home already and uh, if we do deny this, I feel bad that that happened, but that was kind of like you put the horse before the cart was ready to go. So at this point in time, I will not be voting in favor <coughs> of this application. Anyone else with any additional comments? Uh, Mr. Chair, for the purpose of the motion? Yes, sir. Joe's been holding the mic like he has something to say. I apologize. <laughs> I'm sorry, Joe. I missed Mr. you. Chairman. I apologize. Thank you. I was just going to say that if the board wants, I do have a condition prepared. I would love to hear that. Sure. So it's just one condition. The single family dwelling must maintain a minimum 10 foot setback from the edge of the right of way of State Road 200 and North Pioneer Terrace as outlined on the site plan received by the Land Development Division date stamp July 6, 2022. Thank you. Joe, would you read that again, please? Absolutely. The single family dwelling must maintain a minimum 10 foot setback from the edge of the rights of way of State Road 200 and North Pioneer Terrace, as outlined on the site plan received by the Land Development Division, date stamped July 6, 2022. And that actually won't be edge of right of way, it would be the from the property line. Property. Sorry about that, not pavement. Okay. Right, Commissioner Bramlett. The Planning and Development Commission finds application number V-22-13 consistent with the Citrus County Land Development Code and is in keeping with intent of the policies of the Citrus County Comprehensive Plan and that this board approves with the condition of the application based upon the evidence and testimony presented and the staff report and conclusions regarding this petition with the conditions that Joe had read out. And then the one condition. Okay, thank you. Do we have a first from Commissioner Bellman? Do we have a second? I'll second. We are rusty. Goodness. Okay, so um, we have a motion, and then I'll just the the building envelope is definitely there. Uh, if the state of Florida doesn't have a problem with the ten foot setback from the property line along Carl G. Rose Highway, then neither do I. That's okay. why I'm in favor of it. Okay. Any other comments? Seeing none, we have a first from Commissioner Brahma and a second from Commissioner Scraggs. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries six to one. Congratulations, sir. Thank you. Thank you. All, all members. Thank you. Okay. We have <coughs> next on the agenda, we have PUD 22-04. If you could have a little intro by staff, please. Uh, 2204 <coughs> Local Engineering Incorporated for Brett Martin. And Liz, can you move the speaker? The, thank you. This is an aerial view of the home. No, it's not. One second. Sorry, guys. Can you get the audio lady for me, Jen? Go ahead and speak loudly if you have to. Sure. I just need to get this here for y'all. My display mode disappeared. Unfortunately, we have experts right away here. Yes, we sure do. <laughs> for these planners, I can't figure it out. Like All righty, sorry about that, guys. This is an aerial view of the subject property. switching over like um, it's supposed to. It's all right. Can you go ahead and click it? It's a clicker. It looks like oh, it's thank you, Joe. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> or not. Yeah, it's not working right now. I'm not <laughs> sure. Okay. Here's your camera. 
Thank you to our IT person. Yes. Time's a charm. Put 2204 Local Engineering Incorporated for Brett Martin. This is an aerial view of the subject property. <clears throat> this is a view of the subject property. This is looking north on North Pine Cone Avenue. This is looking south on North Pine Cone Avenue. This is looking across Pine Cone. This is a site plan submitted by the applicant. Thank you. Thank you. If the applicant would like to come forward. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning. Michael Wilburn, Local Engineering Inc., PO Box 938, Floral City, Florida. I would like to discuss this project with you guys this morning in five different areas, uh, outlining some things that are itemized in the staff report that you guys have before you. First, I would like to address the site plan that you're currently looking at. Um, this piece of property was previously part of a PUD in the late 1980s. That PUD has since expired. That PUD, I believe, had uh, almost eight units per acre. I think it's in the staff report, uh, 7.6 units per acre. Uh, this request is for uh, around six units per acre. So instead of 38 um, front doors, as previously approved in the PUD, we are asking for 32. Um, the layout itself uh, is set up this way because this is the way that uh, it was previously uh, approved, uh, previously laid out. And you'll notice it's very, it, it's somewhat hard to see and it's very surprising uh, that it's even here. Can I have the clicker to use oh, as yes. a microphone? I'll discuss utilities in a, in a little while however I want to point this out um, there is an existing fire hydrant in the woods right here which is woods now and this property was previously cleared and ready for construction and then it never happened but this is a existing fire hydrant there's an existing water line that runs straight through east to west in the area uh, basically of the right away of this roadway which would be a private roadway um, but that's why the orientation of this site is such that because trying to utilize the existing infrastructure that's already on site and keeping with the originally approved uh, plans. So that's why the layout is as it's shown here. And as previously mentioned, uh, this request uh, for a PUD is actually a reduction in what was previously approved as a plan unit development. So the next thing I would like to address is setbacks. Um, the staff report states that per land development code, um, the setback will be 50 foot from the center line of the right of way. The previously approved PUD, it appears, uh, based on surrounding areas, which I believe you'll see in the staff report if you look uh, to the south and to the west, um, the homes that were built all have an approximate 40-foot setback from um, that center line of the roadway. And so as you see here, I've provided uh, slightly over that 40-foot setback, trying to keep with the average setback of the development that happened around this property. Uh, there are single family homes on the east side of this property, as you'll probably see from an aerial with staff report, and you'll notice all of them have less than or equal to that 40 foot uh, setback from the center line of um, Brandywine. Uh, so, hopefully, you guys will take note of that and see that. So, that is actually a deviation um, that I, I talked to Joanna or Ms. Katu about it previously uh, before this meeting uh, in trying to keep with the intent of the original design. That's what I did. However, unfortunately, and this is my bad. That layer on my AutoCAD when I submitted it didn't come through. I didn't know it didn't come through, and so you don't see that 15-foot setback or 40-foot from the center line of the roadway. Um, but I believe that is in keeping with the same approval as previously done um, in the 80s, as well as being consistent with the development on the east and also on the south of this property. Um, in conjunction with the buffer, um, Right now, there is a request in the staff report suggesting that a type D buffer be required east, north, and west. Uh, this board has heard many times before um, applicants requiring that a type D buffer not be required. 
or, or requesting a type D buffer not be required. Uh, the applicant would be okay with a type D buffer. However, uh, we would love the ability not to have to have a wall. And I believe staff would support that as well based on conversations with Ms. Katu. Uh, so have no issues with a type D buffer and the plantings of a type D buffer. Just would like to not have to construct a six foot wall around the northeast and um, west perimeter. Similar discussion in terms of the buffer. Because we're asking for a reduced setback from 50 foot from the center of the road to 40 foot um, in keeping with the average, that would reduce the 25 foot buffer to a 15 foot buffer, uh, which is open space, green space. So we would, we would ask that in the, um, when you guys consider this for approval, uh, that the recommendation possibly be changed from a 25 foot buffer type D to a 15 foot type D buffer without the wall. And that's because the setback has been reduced from the center line of the roadway. Um, the next big item on the staff report that I would like to address is sewer. I have been in discussion with Citrus County Utilities regarding a manhole that is located over here, which was part of uh, a master plan, a, a, larger, a larger design, utility design. However, this manhole uh, is not deep enough for this project to be serviced by it. There is another manhole that is located about 25 feet south of the property line right here in this development, uh, which is also duplexes. And I had requested staff um, give me an invert elevation and a depth of that inlet, storm inlet, or sorry, sewer inlet, and have yet to receive that. Talked to them again this morning and they're working on that. Uh, I did, however, tell Ms. Katu as well as the utility department that if this inlet also is too shallow and not able to tie in, that we can still accomplish the central sewer requirement of this PUD um, by doing something that the state has already approved, uh, will and environmental health has already approved, and that we have also implemented on other PUDs in the past that this board has approved. And we would do um, basically, for, for lack of a better phrase, a gang aerobic septic tank, uh, have, have maybe one duplex teamed up into one uh, monitored aerobic septic tank that is controlled by an operator, which meets the state's rules for central sewer, and it also complies with the county. And in fact, there's a project less than a mile from here right now that is under construction, which meets that rule because it's monitored, because it's aerobic, uh, and because um, it has more than one um, address going into it. Two or more monitored uh, with an operator is the requirement for central sewer. And so that would be, I would propose, if that manhole is not able uh, to take and accept our sewer, that we would put an aerobic septic system, one aerobic septic system behind each of these duplexes. And then finally, uh, in your staff report, I'm not sure if your pages are the same as mine, but on your staff report, page number four, I would like to professionally disagree uh, with a statement that is made. I'd like to read the statement it is in reference to compatibility. <coughs> it's, uh, it's bold compatibility with adjacent land use. It's about halfway down the page on page four. Due to, due to the predominance of single family dwellings to the north, east, and west, the development as proposed with 10 foot type C buffers, which we, we've already addressed the correction of that, does not appear to be compatible with the surrounding area. Um, hopefully you guys will get a chance to see the surrounding area, but if when that happens and you see that slide, I would like to point out that the property to the east, north, and west, as well as the south, if you were to take a 500 foot diameter circle and draw it around, there are 35 single family homes. Out of that same 500 foot radius, there is 46 single family duplex units. And so I, I would think that um, predominantly the area within 500 feet of this subject property is not single family homes maybe by land area, but not by front doors, not by density. And so I would just like to professionally call that out and, and state that I would just, just disagree. Uh, there are 46 duplex single door units uh, within 500 feet of this property, and there are only 35 single homes. So there's more duplexes than single family homes within 500 feet. And so I would suggest that this property is compatible uh, if it can meet the requirements of the land development code, which I've already stated it can regardless of if sewer is available through that manhole, we can still accomplish it through other state rules with an aerobic septic system. Um, and I've already addressed the, the suggestion that we um, 
we deviate from a 50 foot required setback from the center line of the roadways to a 40 foot in keeping with the previously approved as well as the average setbacks of those around um, this subject property. Not only the setbacks of the duplexes to the south, but also the, the average setbacks from the single family units that are to the east. I would love to answer any questions that you guys have. Thank you. Any questions from staff? Yes, please. Just a few to clarify. Um, first of all, based on what you're saying, um, it looks like you've seen the conditions suggested by staff if this application is recommended for approval to the commissioners. Um, number three, I guess, would change um, instead of 50 feet from the center line, it would be the front setback for structures is 40 feet from the center line. Um, and I think you're actually including, is that going to be a driveway or a road in the middle there? running through the center is that proposes a driveway this is this, these are not platted lots then that's going to be a driveway that's correct okay so it's a 40 foot from the center line of pine cone and north brandywine the remaining sentences in that condition are inapplicable yes th this will be um, owned by one person okay. not sold off or anything like that and then condition number seven about buffers um, you're willing to do a 15 foot type d without a wall on the north south northeast and west now looking at your site plan it looks like on the east side you have drainage there is that going to be an issue it won't I actually showed that um, drainage <coughs> just as uh, a swale so no it won't have any impact at all and so, it's probably so you're not willing to do the necessary. plantings of a D but in a 15 foot um, thing on the northeast and west okay so that would change uh, proposed condition number seven um, engineering talked about access management and would like you to line up with, I was trying to get the deer trail lane there on the east. Can you talk about that or yes. you'll have to improve some so, right of way? Um, I would like to, um, obviously this plan is, is, a, is a plan that comes to you prior to having soil borings and running an exhaustive uh, engineering analysis. However, the reason that roadway is there uh, is because of that existing water line that runs east to west straight through the entire property. And if you'll notice, uh, you don't have it, but you'll see it in just a few moments. Um, there is a platted road that continues to the north that will service the future development to the north and to the northeast. And so, um, yes, we could align it, but in order to do that, uh, we would have to shift everything to the left. I, I don't really have a problem doing that. It would just be when everything is built out, it would be better as presented. But here and now, and right with the lens that we're looking at yes it makes sense to line those up however when you consider that road extending to the north just like the one to the west has now done um, i believe this is a better flow okay so the condition is basically access management must meet the conditions of the code yes. and that will allow you some negotiations with yes. engineering in the future but you're willing to do that yes and then also the condition about central water and sewer um, you you know you have to provide that and it sounds like that was in your yeah, have in your no problem statement. with that either so okay. that I think you identified the two uh, recommendations that that I had outlined here as possibly needing to be changed and I appreciate that discussion if it makes staff more comfortable I would be okay with instead of a 40 foot calling it out as a 40 saying an average um, but again 40 foot is I believe if you if you run the tape measure you'll find that they're between 38 and 40 feet now the What's 40 feet? The average setbacks of every Oh, the other. setback. Yeah, I wouldn't want to do an average. That's Good. kind of confusing. Then I'm, I'm okay 40 with 40 minimum. Is, yes, ma'am. Yeah, okay. Thank that you. That would be fine with me. And then um, there was a, a late public input about Section 8 housing. Is that what's proposed here? To mine, I, yeah, and this is my apology. I didn't receive that till this morning. I did briefly read through it. To my knowledge, there is no desire for any type of Section 8 housing. Uh, also, to my knowledge, these units will be a higher end than what you see currently to the south. Um, this will be a own, single owner um, complex and um, I have I have no knowledge absolutely no knowledge of any type of uh, title 8 chapter 8 housing okay thank you sir thank you. any questions from the commissioners Mike yes this um, these, these aerobic uh, septic systems you said that they would be monitored Yes. Who would do that? You normally, it is the septic tank company who installs it. They get a 24-month contract that has to be submitted to the Environmental Health Department. After that 24-month period, the customer does have the option of going to another septic company uh, to do that monitoring. In my experience, unless there's just a bad relationship that forms, the same person who installs it will continue to monitor it indefinitely. And 
these and they are they are considered the operator of that as well. Okay, these uh, these two manholes that are in uh, pro well fairly close proximity to this development, um, if their inverts are too high, um, is that an impossibility to uh, to lower that to, to make a connection there? Um, again, this is this is a discussion probably to have with utilities. I wouldn't be opposed, but to my knowledge, based on the response that I received, that invert is only about two and a half to three feet deep. It's incredibly shallow. Uh, it's in the county right of way. I'm not, um, because it's that shallow, they would probably have to be, I would, I would be entering into it lower. And so there would have to be some staging involved before it could get up to where it would flow out. So I don't think they would be in favor of that. Um, <coughs> how it ever was put there and, and approved as, as that low, I don't know. Um, but it is one of the shallowest manholes that I've come in contact with. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that the one I talked to you guys about right here uh, is deeper because <coughs> it is on the north end of a run and it flows to a different area than this one. But again, I won't know that for sure. And so obviously this would be ideal if we could tie into this. That would be better than having the aerobics. It would be cheaper for my client. Um, but again, if that's not, if that's not an option, um, then we can still meet the letter of the law and the criteria for central sewer um, through on-site treatment. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Commissioner Facemark. Uh, Michael, um, just to be clear, your, your first choice for um, uh, sewage disposal would be central. Absolutely. Okay. Now, uh, I, can, I can maybe see the wheels turning, so I would like to offer this as, as, um, as some information for you guys as well. The State Health Department while they do acknowledge and while they will allow that um, gang septics to happen with aerobic, in the past on previous projects, um, they have preferred to have multiple aerobics rather than one large treatment facility. I think that's better for everybody. And so while this site could have one large treatment facility, uh, it probably wouldn't be as prudent for everyone involved, including the client, cost-wise, environmentally, and the state would look at the individual aerobics as more favorable because of their impacts as well. And so that's why I didn't, I didn't propose one treatment facility, one package plant on site, um, because in my experience and based on previous projects that we worked with the state on, uh, is more favorable to have those smaller aerobics that are more spread out. So ideally, to answer your question, yes, we would love to tie into the sewer. If that is not available, then we would take the next best option and still meet the criteria. The, so the state monitoring those septic tanks every two years or they're having to be, how does that, is that in so perpetuity? State, That's forever? Yes, the state doesn't monitor them. The state requires that a septic tank provide a contract to them stating that they are monitoring them. And then they don't get to see any reports or anything because I don't get, know anything about that. They get a report that. every 24 months. It has to be turned in yes. to the environmental health. Yes. Okay. Where does something like that go? Like does that get recorded or it just stays on file? I believe it stays on file here locally. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I would just say that I, I definitely have concerns about the whole septic situation here and the sewage. Um, if the state, if there are options out there that the state would approve and they think that it's safe for all of the residents in the surrounding area, then I'm definitely not here to usurp the state. And just to clarify on the comp the comprehensive plan defines central sewer, not although we think of it as maybe county or, or something like that. It also clarifies if it serves two or more users and has an operator. So the gang type things he's talking about meet that definition, but as you it sounds like it's not ideal either. They can't just have individual septics on these. That's not central sewer and that won't be approved, but it sounds like it's still the work in progress. Yeah, and obviously it would be better to have one septic system. Um, per two duplexes and for each one of these to have its own. Yeah, right. Um, and the same thing, we're gonna start seeing, and you guys will start seeing this as well, RV parks, instead of having huge package plants, having six to eight RVs tying into one aerobic system uh, and meeting those central sewer requirements because of what Ms. Katu said. We'll see that because it's more environmentally friendly and that's something that's gonna start playing out more and more as time goes on. This idea and this concept I'm presenting to you. Would they, be, would they be mounded systems in that area? I mean, I know the elevation's pretty high there. No, they would not. And, um, and the soil, you see it in the report, but the soil is very good, perks very well. 
um, the ponds will be minimal size because of okay. how good the soil is. Any other comments? Michael, uh, <coughs> your planned drainage DRAs for this, is this in the square or? Yes, it's, there's a long that runs east to west on the north side and the south side. And is there any planned recreation area? Yes, um, there'll be a walking trail around the perimeter. You can see that the DRA is set off um, because of that. There's also active space behind each one of the duplexes, uh, as well as there, we are exceeding this required setback from the center line of that driveway, 55 feet instead of 50 on the closest, about 70 feet on the furthest. So there's active recreation in front and back of each unit, as well as around the entire perimeter. And I believe there's a comment somewhere in the staff report stating that a sidewalk would be required on east to west on at least one side of that roadway, and that's not a problem whatsoever. That's a good idea. Yes, Commissioner Scraggs. I have a question. The parking, I see the two spaces for each unit. Where would anybody else park that comes to visit? That's a good question. Has more than two cars and a family? So all of the spots that you see here, while they are in front of the duplex specifically, um, they're not designated. And you'll notice in the staff report, I believe we're providing 16 or 18 more spots than is required. And so there will, there will be an abundance of parking available uh, for people to park. Where is the extra parking? So there's only 1.4 parking spaces required per unit, and we're providing two per unit. And so that adds up to being, I think, I can tell you exactly. Uh, we're at well over the required. Um, There's not a deviation in the conditions, so at the time of permitting, they would have to meet land development code standards regardless. Even though you yeah. kind of see some delineated there, they'd have to meet LDC's requirements. I'm pretty sure it's in here somewhere, though. Can you guys help me? Oh, there spaces. it is. Yeah, we're, we are required to have 45 spaces, and we're providing 64, so 19 extra. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments? <coughs> Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you. Okay, at this time we'll open up the public portion of the meeting. If there's anyone. Oh. Staff. I'm sorry, I apologize, staff. We are so out of practice. Yeah, you know, so you, we, we a take lot, a month off and we're all screwed up. Meeting, well. you, know, we're you are so out of practice. I tell you, one month off, never again. <coughs> If you want to take me out to the whooping shed afterwards, that's okay. <laughs> well, good morning. Jen Perkins, planner. PUD 2204 is a request to amend an existing expired planned unit development to allow for multifamily use of greater than four dwelling units per acre in the medium density residential district. This is an aerial view of the subject property that totals approximately 4.94 acres. It takes access from North Pinecone Ave and is located approximately 1,000 feet north of West Norval Bryant Highway. It also abuts North Brandywine Terrace to the east, which I apologize is not labeled on this slide. Um, and that um, portion of Brandywine is not constructed past the intersection with West Deer Trail Lane. <clears throat> In 1986, an application was approved that established a planned unit development on this parcel and the parcel to the south. The PUD was approved at 7.6 dwelling units per acre. As you can see, the parcel to the south was developed and the PUD has since expired. This is a view of the subject property. These are the single family or some of the single family dwellings that are located to the north and west. These are some of the multifamily units that are located to the south. On the left, uh, I'm looking east on West Deer Trail Lane. My back is to the property. If I pivot left to the north, you can see that this is the section of Brandywine that is not currently constructed. From top left to right, bottom left to right is the north, south, east, and west property lines. So this is the most recently submitted master plan. Um, the master plan depicts 32 units, which is approximately 6.48 <coughs> dwelling units per acre. MDR allows for up to eight dwelling units per acre with a PUD. Central water is available, but central sewer is not. However, Dr. Wilburn has talked about uh, meeting this requirement because a comprehensive plan does require connection to central water and sewer with densities at four dwelling units per acre or greater. 
apologies. The master plan also proposes for the development to take access from Pinecone and Brandywine. Again, that uh, segment of Brandywine is currently not constructed, so the applicant would need to uh, construct that segment to county road standards from that intersection with Deer Trail to the um, entrance of the development. That entrance to the development needs to be at least 125 feet from that intersection. Based on the master plan as it's depicted right now, that separation criteria does not appear to be met. As Dr. Wilburn mentioned, engineering has uh, expressed a preference for them to connect their driveway at West Deer Trail Lane. However, Dr. Wilburn has addressed why the layout is as it is right now. The master plan provides for approximately 67% open space. Um, I was not aware of the um, recreation area. However, again, Dr. Wilburn has addressed that. It is required and will be um, required at the time of permitting. So initially, we had some concerns about the connection to Central Sewer. Again, Dr. Wilburn does appear to have addressed these uh, concerns. Do you have any questions for me? Any questions from staff, uh, from commissioners? I, I yes, have a, sir. I have a question. You said there are um, 32 units with 64 parking spots, mm -hmm. but the uh, but uh, Mike had said that uh, the total required would be based upon 1.4 cars per. Correct. That is our minimum requirement would be 45 parking spaces because of our parking schedule at 1.4 parking spaces per dwelling unit. Right. Not too many point four cars around, though, if, you were, yeah, if you're a couple know. living <laughs> in, a, in a place. Smart uh, cars. That's the smart cars is electric cars. You, pro you probably got two, uh, two cars per, uh, per family despite what the criteria is. Is that right? That would be my guess. And, uh, and how wide is that central driveway in there? Are cars able to park on both sides and still pass in the middle? 24 feet. 24. That's something the applicant will have to provide, Jen. Okay. I, it's not really something you, you can elaborate on. Okay. okay. All right. I, I have no further questions. Any other questions, sir? Uh, I, I do have a question, and maybe um, it's better answered by uh, Dr. Wilburn. Um, but he, he mentioned earlier, um, he was talking about North Brandywine and eventually it could be extended beyond what we see on, on this plan. Um, when I'm looking at uh, some of the uh, background material, it looks like that would extend into what I believe is a previously approved uh, PUD that it's called Davis Reserve, I think. Um, so can somebody help me with that? I can start and then <laughs> Dr. Wilburn can jump in. So West Deer Trail Lane is, comes in right about here. It's not shown on this map, so it's right about here. Yep. So it's only extending up to um, that fence that was in that picture. Oops. No, I, I understand. Right I understand this part. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is about potential extend the potential to extend that into a, another PUD that um, is in Brentwood. And, and I see. Yeah, I'll address that. I apologize. Uh, Brentwood has a condition that that may be used in the future as an emergency access point, but it's not at all platted or developed, and this applicant is not planning on going past that property line into into Brentwood. So, so it's a right-of-way? It, it's an easement, easement in the Brentwood property, and it is addressed in their PUD as it, it, a possible someday emergency thing, but it's not at all developed or platted at this time. No, so no, it would, it would stay so an easement, and I, I, they're going to go to the property line and not within that easement is what's proposed here. Okay. Just uh, one other question while we're on Davis Reserve. Um, this this uh, application is approximately 6.5 density. What do you remember what the density in that Brentwood? You know, unfortunately, I don't. Um, it wasn't six. I want to say it was somewhere in four to five area. Yeah, I mean, I, it obviously would be less, but right, it wasn't multifamily or anything like that. Yeah. Okay. Thank so, you. any other comments? I have questions. Yes, sir. I just want to know what the staff thinks about the deviations being requested. Joanna, do you want to address? So that? we got the the front setback. 
of 40 feet from um, Pinecone and Brandywine, and he's talked about that that's um, consistent with the multifamily to the south. Correct. So, and um, the houses, he said. And, right. Um, and you're okay, and the staff is okay with that? Like Yes, we would do a front average anyway on those roadways, so uh -huh. we probably would, would end up that way anyway, okay. or very close to that. All right. Um, as far as the reduced buffer from a 25 foot D with a wall to a 15 foot without a wall, it's still a type D. Um, not a fan of walls, as you guys are, aren't, I don't think, either. Um, I don't like reducing the width, but the plantings of a type D are our plantings of a type D. So whether it's 15 or 25, plus you can look on the site plan, and those are the drainage areas on the uh -huh. north and south. So that's preferable, and the roads on either side. So the buffer, not really a, a concern on that one. Um, is that the only two? Still deviations I can think of yeah. Um, otherwise, yeah. What about the access point? Sorry. Access point, yeah, it's it's left as, as in the condition says access management has to meet land development code. So it, it's it's leaving it open for further discussion on that one. Um, absolutely would support one engineering once. Engineering is it, not as strong as saying they must access on that deer, deer trail. They, they're saying they pref prefer it. So if they choose to continue like this, engineering will force them to improve the roadway to that access point. So there would have to be an agreement between developer and engineering? Correct, the and the condition just says have to meet access management, so that locks them in. Engineering right. is gonna have to sign off on okay. that. I'd also point out, and we missed it earlier, um, condition number 11, if this is recommended, is says sidewalks should be ins installed on at least one side of the roadway. It's not a roadway central, as, as Dr. Wilburn has testified. That would be the instead driveway. of at least one side of the main driveway. So we're not confusing those like little... Like the access road is what we're talking about. Because originally not when road, I read that, yeah. I thought it was like pine cone or something. But we're talking about the We're talking about the, the main driveway, which is the access towards uh, east, west, and the center. Correct. So I think we changed drive, uh, roadway to main driveway if this went forward that way. Any other? Um, in regards to the access, did I hear you <coughs> correctly that North Brandyway Terrace, there's an existing easement that extends beyond what is currently paved? That's just an easement. It is not owned by the county. It's not a county right-of-way. It's an aerial. Yeah, she can show it on the area a little better. There is an easement there. The uh, Brandy one does continue, as you can see there, kind of. See between the green lines. I know it's not very clear. So We're looking at Brandy this wine. This is the easement, right? Right there. Yes. Right. Oops. Who owns that easement? Yeah. That's, that's, that's <coughs> so, therefore, the applicant would have to get the right to pass across that if I. He's not planning on doing that. Um, he, Right, he's going up to, see Deer Trail is where the pavement stops and he's planning on extending it up to that yellow line which is where he would access that. Um, beyond that is exactly what uh, Mr. Facemeyer is saying, that's Brentwood property and that's not part of this application, that there's no plan to extend further. So he's staying within what is county property, that's it, his intent. I heard the audience say it's county, I'm not convinced it's, it's truly county owned but it is a count, p public right of way. Right. Okay. And if I understood Dr. Wilburn correctly, he indicated that this is going to be a driveway. They're going to consider it as a driveway. No, no. They're going to have their drive. It's a road. They have to right, construct but the road. The they're having the main driveway from east to west, and yes. they're going to tie into the extension. Yes. Of the, I'm sorry. The east west connector thing is a driveway and not a road that's normal for multifamily. Yes. Okay. So. Because it's a driveway, do we still have to meet the requirements for separation since it's a driveway? Yes, their driveway. it's a driveway access point, so it would have to meet separation from Deer Trail Lane from, from any access onto Brandywine or access onto Pine Cone. Okay. They're, they're like driveway cuts on either okay, end. Okay, so they have to meet the, the separation of 125 feet. Or whatever engineering does is they're alternate. They have some modification okay. ability in there, yes. All right. Thank you. And I'm sure the applicant will correct me. I am not an engineer if I've missaid anything. <laughs> scary, scary. <laughs> we'll give her an A for the day. Uh,
Any other comments or questions? Yeah, I just have a question. Uh, what if engineering and the applicant could not come up with some sort of agreement on where the access point should be? Would there be a situation where they would then just only have one entrance on the other side? If engineering approved it as one entrance, perhaps, but that's a big change from what y'all are looking at. They would um, have to come back. I, I think so, okay. yeah. The way you're describing it, that's not even a minor modification. They, they'll have the ability to work out access <coughs> management, and the plan that you're seeing is the plan you're seeing. Completely removing an access point is pretty major, and that's one I would force to come back to y'all. And he stood up on that one. So. <laughs> right. Go ahead. If and remember, and she's already kind of alluded to this, the engineering division has the ability to do administrative adjustments in that 125 feet also. And there's other triggers and rules that, that may not apply in this case because it is a dented road leading to an easement. However, if we weren't able in your question to come into terms, then most likely we would just lose a unit on the end and come in where we want, turn, and then get back to the road. I don't, I don't believe it would be right to go to one access point, even if we could. Well, maybe while you're still standing there, what, there's some sort of perception that this is Section 8 for whatever reason. I don't know. I, that happens all the time whenever there's a multifamily unit. Is there some sort of condition that we can provide that says, you know, this, that it's not because you've said I, that it's I not? I don't think to. legally we can do that. Um, yeah, right. You've heard his statement that he has no plans for that, but I don't think we can say, and you can't do this. Yeah. But um, he's made the statement that this was not planned for workforce, but actually more for an upscale type development. You've had the statement. I, I, I can't yeah. prohibit. No, I guess. I guess. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> Any other questions? Uh, I just have one, one final small question, um, and it may be in the uh, backup information, but um, do we know approximately how many square feet each of these units will be? No. Approximately. Not in there. Yeah. I'm going out on a limb here, but I believe they're 890 square feet total, so okay. 900 and something a unit. All right. Thank you. They're two bedroom, two bath. Thank you. With that, we'll open up the public portion of this meeting. As a reminder, you'll have three minutes to speak. And we're looking for anyone wishing to speak in favor of the application. Anyone wishing to speak in favor? Anyone wishing to speak in favor? Seeing none, we'll move to anyone wish to speak in opposition of this application. Please step forward. Please step forward. State your name and submit a yellow copy to our recording secretary, please. My name is Stephen Bagdon. Um, I live on the property directly adjacent to it to the left. You'll see that it's vacant. Um, it's actually T connection with the property on 2421 West Springleaf Lane. Um, I'd like to, uh, well, first point out, I don't want a whole bunch of houses put right across from, my, right from where I can pull out. Um, but besides that, um, I wanna, I guess, point out the safety measure. Um, you're looking at what he said were 35, uh, residential families within a 500 square foot radius and you put at talking about putting another 32 in that's almost doubling that the amount of cars that run on that road and the way that you're talking about developing it on Brandywine the main entrance and exit to that road is going to be on North Pinecone um, it's also the only road that has direct access to Norville Bryant Highway um, if you take Brandywine, you're going to end up having to take multiple roads before you get to Norville Bryant, which means the congestion point is going to force people to take North Pinecone Avenue. Um, that road's already kind of hard to get in and out of, as it is with the amount of residents that are on there. Um, trying to think of any other points that I can make. Um, honestly, uh, as of right now, I'd almost want to push for there being a uh, a stoplight at North Pinecone and uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a little bit out of it. I'm running off of coffee this morning. Um, basically what I'm saying is that the traffic on that road um, shouldn't or won't be able to handle the capacity of adding that many homes safely anyway. Um, I mean, if, if I'm wrong, I'm sure you guys have 
rules and regulations that, that show what the capacity is, but I have yet to hear anything about that. Um, also, um, you're talking about adding a whole bunch of different waste disposal areas that aren't fully set up yet. Um, you were talking about putting the, the cart before the horse on that with the different projects in the past. It's sort of, um, I'd say, an incomplete plan. I, if the regulations and everything say that you can put <coughs> that many houses in there um, legally, I, I'd honestly say that it'd be postponed until it can be proven that you can safely enter and exit that area given the pine cone access. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Please state your name for the record and did you submit a yellow form? My name is, yes. Thank you. My name is Herb Sickler. Um, I live at 2351 West Woodview Lane. Pine cone curves into Woodview and that road on the, the right which the gentleman mentioned that there's a road it's my property it's my property it's my road the county we take we've already been involved with the county and the county told us we have to maintain it that's all but the problem is the traffic on this road uh, pine cone has increased since they put the last um, uh, project in, and I, it, if it keeps on increasing, that road is a small road. It's not a regular sized road. Uh, you can get two, maybe tractor trailers side by side, but you're forcing each other off the road. I have been forced off that road all the time because it's too small. So I'm just letting the county know that it's it's going to involve them. And it's going to, I just hope it doesn't involve me for the increase of the road. Um, but the, the traffic is, is not even mentioned in this. And it, it's, it's getting bad. Um, and, of course, you got the speeders up and down, you know, from this project. You got, always got trash on the road, which they've been cleaning up now. I'm not saying negative stuff about that now. But it's the overall traffic is that I'm concerned uh, because it's not big enough. And we're, if we're gonna have to have a red light there, then we're gonna have to have red light or we'd be sitting there, you know, at least 10, 15 minutes sometimes to get across the road, which is B486 <coughs> or 491. I just wanna let you know that. All right, thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? My name is Michael Cozy. I'm on lot 36, just north of this here. And to add that many houses in that small area, I live on five acres, and the rest of the property around there close to me is in five acres. And you crowd all these houses on a small area down there is ridiculous. They got the low income houses uh, south of me just before uh, uh, Grover Noble, uh, right? They got them little black kids running out there playing uh, basketball <coughs> right on that road. My neighbor almost hit a couple. I almost hit a couple <clears throat> because they got the basketball hoops right next to the mailbox on the road. That's going to allow so much traffic going down pine cone. People uh, take a, uh, a uh, shortcut so they don't, don't go to the light on 491 in Noble Bryan. So they come down Pinecone for uh, Woodview, and we're getting so much traffic down here. I'm on five acres and I'm fenced in, and the, the traffic on there 
and adding all these houses with uh, traffic is going to be ridiculous because two cars got to go very slow to go by. That speed limit should be, is 30 mile an hour going on there and it should be 15 to 20 miles an hour uh, on there. Um, I'm, I'm not for this development going in. Uh, too many houses, like I say, we're on five acres. It's nice kingdom there. You get those things crowded up, like those uh, uh, low low income houses down there. People are changing in and out of there, and it's got traffic going there. They have parties on on the road. They're they're parked on the road. You you, you got to go around them. No, I, I don't want the property on there. That's, that's right. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Yes, sir. Take a podium like that's a judge sitting up there. <laughs> well, I have the gavel if you want me to smack it a couple times, that'll make you feel good. All right, we talked about the traffic. Name, I okay, uh, sir, name. excuse me, sir, yeah. sir, name, please, Gordon name and Montgomery. address. Pardon me, Gordon Montgomery. Thank you. I live right across the street. Now, the first community they've already showed us what they have to offer that community, it's nothing but trash, it's horrible. Uh, the other one was, there's a church at one end and a church at the other. This, it, it's too, too much traffic. I drive a dually and I have to get off the road to get by on that road. The other one was, this is part of a community. It's uh, Crystal Oaks, Crystal River Oaks or something. How can they build this many houses in a community that's already set? They slipped the first one by us. We didn't move here to live next to that. And they can't promise us they ain't going to have Section 8 over. And I just think it's a bad idea. And in fact, y'all ought to buy my property. Put about 40 more over there. Yeah, because I'm not going to live next to that. It's, it's upsetting. <coughs> you know, we've lived there 20 years. And anyway... That's all I got to say. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? <laughs> Good morning, Commission. My name is Melanie Bad, B A G G S. And this is my husband, Steve. Yeah. And it's good to meet with you today. Um, uh, today, we traveled over two hours to come to this meeting, and you're like, why did you do that? Well, we live in Deltona, Florida, but we just recently purchased a piece of paradise on Pinecone at 2349. We're getting ready to build our dream home there. Um, we have sent packets to you guys with concerns of what's going on down the road at the Section 8 housing with the trash. Um, there's me, also no been incidents in the background. Thank you. Pardon? Oh. There's also that. been incidences of. Uh, dump sites on some of the homes that are being constructed that they had to clean out that residents were on camera using. Um, there were children on building sites that are no trespassing sites. One actually left a bike and the builder drove around trying to see if they'd come out and claim their bike. I guess it was his after that. So there is people coming down that road using it for other purposes and we all live on these beautiful pieces of property. Um, we are from, as I say, Deltona. We um, worked for 40 years. My husband's a water superintendent over in Castleberry. I worked in the medical billing field. And we worked sometimes two jobs to be able to afford what we're going to be doing on that property. And we looked for many years and found this beautiful parcel. We just uh, mulched it, put a nice <coughs> fence up in front, which was run into recently and destroyed because of the traffic on that road. Somebody left their amber lights all over it. Obviously didn't leave a note that they tore up our fence. Um, and we want to live here. We grew up, our kids grew up going to Crystal River. We were so happy to find something within 15 minutes 
of Crystal River, our kids grew up scalloping and fishing those waters. And we want to be able to have our grandchildren enjoy that property. We're hoping to have horses that we can ride up and down that road. Obviously, with the increased traffic, that's going to be dangerous. Um, <coughs> we look, as I said, we look for many years just to find this. And we're very concerned about what's going on with the increased uh, number of homes that are going to be built. As has been stated, there, he said there are approximately 800 plus square feet homes. How can those not be high end? How could they be high end homes at that small a home? You'd expect them to be much larger if they're going to be high end and not possibly be Section 8 down the road. Um, let's see. Additionally, we were um, on only on the paperwork, it said there were only 500 feet of that um, community that's projected to be built that were notified. We talked to a bunch of our neighbors, and by the way, we have wonderful people we've already met, and we've only been here six months getting ready to build the house. All these people are amazing. They stop and say hi, ask if we need anything. Um, and oops, I'm out of time. But that, that is our main concern, the amount of traffic and the amount of residents will be living there and what possibly could happen in that area with that increase. And a quick question on the schematic that was shown uh, for the, not septic paint, but aerobic sanitation. Um, looks to me like there's swells that go in for drainage. Now, what happens if something for the septic or the anaerobic gets washed out during a heavy storm? Is it going into the, the swell uh, next to uh, Magnolia Village? And we sent pictures of <laughs> Magnolia yes. Village too, the Section 8 section. Right. So we are very Th concerned. All right. So Thank you, sir. Appreciate right. it. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? <coughs> Thank you very much. My name is Lillian Idana Davis, and I own lot 63 off of Woodview Lane, which is very close to the 90-degree turn off of uh, Pinecone and Woodview. But I've lived in that area since October of 98, and most recently, since 2008, I'm actually the only single owner. I am currently married, and my husband and I both have noticed in the few years that we've continued you know, growth in that area that there's been substantial changes, especially with the kids playing in the middle of the highway, which was a major concern. It's also a safety factor right there on Pinecone. Um, I've been there long enough to know. We were there when we were part of the um, Chris River Country Woods Estates Home Division, which is a plant, uh, which is a restricted area in 2002 I believe it was somewhere between 2000 and 2002 we met as a homeowners group we were actually able to annex the northern section because it wasn't governed by the homeowners association properly because it had gone defunct and it had started an ad hoc committee and they weren't receptive to our our neighborhood in that area so we were able to get annexed from that but we still buy a go, go and abide by the homeowners association rules in the area the other thing is that the trash that's been on that side of the road in front of the Magnolia Village there has been horrific. Uh, I've got pictures or had pictures and multiple pictures, and I know all the rest of them have too, of that area. It's very, it's very enlightening. Number three, uh, the fact that the traffic lights on both south and northwest corners are basically, if that continues to grow, even now, even without the continued growth, we do need red lights on those areas, especially at board, uh, Woodview and... 491 there because that is it's a it's an accident waiting for happen as a matter of fact there's been many accidents there um, as is on 490 uh, 491 oh, excuse me pine cone and 486 which is normal bryant the other concern that has not been addressed at all is the environmental impact in this area we have a large number of wild turkeys and a great number of gopher turtles gopher turtles in my area are all over the place and we love them we feed them because we're allowed to uh, we're not allowed to pick them up unless you pick them up and remove them from danger, which is in the middle of the highway. There is an attorney that's in Tampa who is a gopher turtle activist. His name is Richard Manny, who is property owner here in Citrus County, who is very advocate, uh, advocating highly, well, let's see, constantly uh, approaching the wildlife management to do something about the homeowners that are moving to the area about these gopher turtles. Um, we recently just had an incident on our property with a new with a new neighbor that moved in that's facing pine cone with a similar issue had to had to call several times to wildlife and without people's intervention 
of these wildlife environmental is issues, they're going to be extinct. They're already protected uh, species, so I'm asking the neighborhood to please, you know, band together and stop the growth, stop the infringing on our environment, and so forth. That's it. Thank and you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? <laughs> Got to move quicker. Because if you speak in opposition to this, he gets three. Do you have one for the applicant as well? Thank you. My name is Gasson Hall. I live at 2200 West Deer Trail Lane in Flying Dutchman Estates. I've lived, lived there since 1985. Um, I worked with a developer both in Flying Dutchman Estates and also the multifamily project down south of this property. Um, this project cannot hook up to, to central sewer because A, the manholes are too, too shallow, but also the piping out of those manholes that go downstream are not large enough to handle the additional flow this project would create. As far as the aerobic systems, I sat on this DOH board of in for the state of Florida for variances for that. Now it's been turned over to DEP. There are separation requirements from any type of patch, patch uh, excuse me, any type of aerobic system are the lines from property lines, from buildings, from any other source from any drainage so you'll have to be cognizant of that if you want to look at the aerobic system for this project the master plan does not show the 25 foot type D with a wall that should be required on the northeast and west side the northeast and west side are single-family homes the flying Dutchman is probably the most dense the other are five acre tracks normally have just one house per five acre this is a lot denser than those properties. Brandywine is owned by the county. Uh, several years ago, the, the residents of Flying Dutchman State got together and we raised several hundred thousand dollars and had the roads redone in Flying Dutchman Estates. At that point, we decided not to fund the pavement from west, from the Deer Trail going north. So that is a county owned right away. The point of which they want to tie in does not meet the 125 foot from the intersection. So they may try to rational that out. They may try to go for, you know, work with engineering, but it is a requirement that if you're going to tie into that from an intersection, you must be 125 feet away. It is not. Uh, there's no recreational areas shown on the plans as that have been submitted, no dimensions on the plans. There's no fire hydrant that was shown on the plans, even though there is one there. Um, a new master plan should be done and submitted back to this board before you all do any kind of improvement showing all of these items that you all have questioned, that staff has questioned, that the public has raised before you even make an attempt to move this on to the county commissioners. I would mm -hmm. ask you that you continue with this until you get a revised master plan. But if the applicant doesn't want to continue this and, and provide one, I ask that you deny this application. Any questions? Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Good morning. Good morning. Angel Lewis is my name, and um, I have lived at 2458 uh, West Springleaf Lane since I was in elementary school. Um, I'm going to start off with uh, Dr. Seuss. I'm speaking for the trees. Um, I'm also with them on, um, we do see a lot of uh, turkeys and gopher turtles. And um, it, what he, they're thinking doesn't fit with the original intentions of, of, of where we live. Um, they're uh, two and a half 
five acre lots. Um, and that's how it's been um, for most of my life before the um, low income housing had come over there. Um, I feel like we should deny this because you snooze, you lose, right? It's expired, like let's be done with that. That's just my um, opinion. Um, I think uh, what everybody has said previous of me is exactly right. Um, we all know each other. Um, a lot of us have lived there a long time. Uh, the road, Pinecone, is very, very thin. I do have a truck. I do have to get off the uh, road to let somebody go by. Um, also, uh, the kids playing in the road, that happens every day. I actually have a son, uh, seven years old, and he wants to go play with the little boy too because they're in the same class, and I won't let them play over there. I make them come to my house because um, me and my husband said it's not, um, it's not if, it's when it's going to happen that um, somebody's going to get hurt over there. So my son <coughs> is not allowed to play basketball over there because of those reasons. It is a very, very busy cut through. Um, so I don't know if you guys have been down this road, but everything that they're saying is absolutely 100% true. Um, there's also a hill right there where they were speaking of making the entrance. So like literally, I stopped going both, um, coming one way and going the other way, just to make sure somebody else is not coming over that hill because the road is not wide enough and it is, it, it's very, very uh, scary. Um, I've seen, which is very sad, but I've also seen at least, I think it was actually their dogs in the back, I've seen at least uh, three dogs hit uh, and killed on that road just because of how fast people go through, how um, much people use it as a cut through, and again, about that hill and the size of the road. It's just, it's very, very uh, dangerous. Also, um, the low income part of it. You know, he comes up here and he says, well, you know, we're pretty sure we're not gonna blah, 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 right? And so we've all seen how that goes down, right? So I feel like that is scary for us because we have the low income. I don't think we need any more of it. And if you can't make a promise, and, and I guess it's not legally allowed, that's you know nerve-wracking for everybody because we do have a lot of that already. Where the low-income housing is now, it at least slightly fits because there was apartments over there that have been there forever. So at least it was like, you know, uh, apartments and then duplexes, it kind of matches. Where you're talking about right now, we're all on um, like large lots with single family homes and so. Um, I think that I got pretty much all of that in. So is there anything else for anybody? <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Anyone else in opposition? Excuse me, could you leave your yellow slip with the recording secretary? Right. Thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Anyone else in opposition? Anyone in opposition? Dr. Wilburn, any comments? I'd just like the opportunity to go through um, these in order. Um, it sounds like there is an overwhelming sense of the, um, the residents in the area not liking the adequacy of the existing road. Um, their concerns, a lot of their concerns are surrounding that road. Um, I would like to point out to you guys that the widening of 486 is not something that has happened uh, many, many years ago. This is in recent history. And so when that analysis would have been done on that roadway, part of the requirements, even at our own LDC, is to look at FDOT requirements. And so the densities of the existing land areas around those roads and those feeder roads would have been taken into consideration. And so uh, it's not shown on this map, but where 486 and Pinecone hit, there is a median there. Um, there's right and left turn. There's left turn if you're heading east into onto Pinecone. If you're leaving Pinecone onto 486, you can turn to the right or to the left. Uh, that would have all been incorporated into the traffic design and the analysis for the county uh, when that when that roadway was designed and when that roadway was built. And so uh, at that time, the existing zoning was a PUD that allowed for 7.96 units per acre on this parcel. We're actually showing a reduction of that density. And so if it was if it was allowable for the higher density, certainly it would not trigger a light or require a light for this lower density that we're proposing now. Um, the second individual discussed uh, the narrowness of that road. That is a 50 foot wide of way. As you can see there on Pinecone, uh, the roadway is 22 feet wide, asphalt to asphalt, which is pretty common on these types of roads in the county. It's not a narrow right of way. Uh, some right of ways we have in the county are 40 or 50 feet, or sorry, 30 or 40 feet. Uh, this is a 50 foot right of way with a 22 foot wide asphalt to asphalt roadway. 
You'll notice if you guys can remember or have the site plan in front of you, there's no storage uh, proposed in this development. There's no large parking. There's no oversized vehicle parking. And so uh, if you think about these types of developments and where they've happened in other places, I know uh, Mr. Stone kind of mentioned this briefly in his, some of his questions. Um, many times there is just one vehicle. They're not going to be large vehicles. Uh, possibly they're going to be widow, widower type people, um, maybe even snowbirds that have one vehicle down here. Uh, and I'm certainly, um, you guys can see that and have seen that, I'm sure, in other areas of these types of developments with these smaller two bed, two bath houses. Um, there is existing multifamily, which has been mentioned by the third person to the south. Several other people have mentioned this as well. Um, I have no desire to talk about race. Uh, in, in the discussion of what's to the south, what's, what's in the surrounding areas. Uh, however, I would like to point out that that development, even though it was originally part of this PUD, has no affiliation with this, the current owner and client of this parcel. Uh, so that project and that property and those owners have no affiliation whatsoever, and I would like you and I encourage you to view those as two separate projects. Um, and then there's some, there was some discussion about kids and crime. Uh, again, I, I don't know that that's, that's something that this board should consider. Um, there was a discussion about the small homes um, by two different people, uh, person number five and person number eight. And my firm has also been retained to do the structural or the architectural design construction plans for this. And um, I never used the phrase, um, pretty sure this won't be chapter eight. I said to my knowledge, there has been no discussion of that and that is true. And also, because my firm is doing the architect architectural plans, I know that there's not anything in these houses that are what I would consider builder grade or spec. Um, they're higher end, they're nicer, and they're, they're similar to other projects that we've designed and finished and have been assets to the community and have actually increased property values because of, their, because of the design and the uniqueness of the um, construction. Person number six discussed uh, playing in the roadway. Again, I don't know that that's something that this board should consider. However, you have seen on the site many areas in the, in the rear and the front of this um, particular, particular development where people can be um, having active recreation. Garbage pickup is available. Uh, we will do that just like everybody else does that. Uh, can't control what other people do, what other developments do, and how other development and owners run their parcels. Um, there was also a discussion in that, again, about a red light um, when that roadway was designed. This density was 7.96. I believe the, to the northeast was a little bit um, lower than that. None of those have been built. We're asking for a reduced density now. So uh, that red light wasn't required then. It's certainly not going to be required now, even though this area is being developed and built out. Uh, it still complies with the original design criteria uh, that the county would have used. There was also a discussion about turtles. In the staff report, a biological survey is required. We have no problems with that. It's part of the LDC. It happens on, on parcels all the time and have no problem complying with that. I've already mentioned that there is a fire line running east to west on this parcel at one time. Uh, in recent history, this parcel was almost completely cleared uh, and, and has now grown back with some of the underbrush and brush and trees that you see now, smaller trees. And so, yes, a biological um, survey is required. Any type of remediation for turtles or other wildlife that is uncovered by that will obviously be uh, required and will be complied with per the LDC. And it's common in projects like this. Um, okay, number seven provided you, Mr. Hall provided you guys with a list. As you go through that list, you'll notice that almost everything on here we've discussed, including the fire hydrant, which is on site. Um, I would also like you guys to, to consider and to understand that that aerobic septic system, if that is what is required, and like Mr. Facemeyer suggested, we're not able to tie into that sewer, uh, that is directly south, then that is required to be peer reviewed. That has to be an engineered system that has certain requirements. Um, there was, uh, I believe, person number four also questioned, what about in a rain event? Uh, what if, what would something happen with that aerobic system? Would it get into the stormwater? Would it leave the property? There are certain setbacks. There are certain requirements for those aerobic systems, and all of that will be met, and all of that can be met. And um, me and Ms. Katu talked, me and Ms. Katu talked about that prior to this meeting as well. Uh, so again, that's another engineered review process that will all be um, peer reviewed as well as certified by uh, the state health department here. And then the last uh, comment, it doesn't fit in with the surroundings. Um, again, I would just simply state that I believe I, there's 35 um, single family residences and 42 single family duplexes in the surrounding area. So to say it doesn't comply or, or fit in with the surroundings, 
I don't know that is, is a 100% adequate statement. Um, we've already uh, proven and shown that there was a higher density on this previously. We're requesting that that uh, density be um, just reduced a little bit as a part of the PUD. Uh, it allows for a request for a density up to eight units per acre, and we're not requesting that. I think 6.4 is what we're requesting. As of right now, um, I believe this property could have 20 units per acre, and so we're just asking for, um, by rights within the PUD process, to allow um, this density that we're requesting for these 32 units. Um, and then I've already addressed the architectural design of those buildings. Not that it's not that it's something that this board would normally see. However, um, I would again submit that they're not builder grade, and uh, that I think it's going to be uh, a very nice development. And I, I would be happy and proud to put my name on it as the designer. And uh, I believe that is all the questions or the comments I have in, in feedback to public comment. If you guys are okay with me sitting back down, we're all set. Thank you. Thank you. Any final comments from staff? No, sir. Thank you very much. We we'll return it back to the board for discussion and potential actions. Anyone wishing to start? Yeah, I'll open up. Thank you. So um, we hear we hear a lot of these recently. Uh, the room gets filled up completely, standing room only, and everybody says the same thing. You know, it's traffic. We don't need any more development. Uh, one of the one of the opponents actually said, "Stop the growth." Um, I've, I'm a lifelong resident of Citrus County, lived here my entire life, went through the school system, graduated, still live here, raised kids here. Citrus County is growing. Uh, our, one of our next um, items on the agenda, there's a, an, an analysis for the Suncoast Parkway and Citrus County was re rated as the number one destination in the state of Florida to relocate to. The state of Florida in general is growing. Everything is growing. The, we, we hear the same thing from everyone. Traffic, um, you know, don't need this in my backyard. And it's, I understand it. It's, we hear you, I hear you, we hear all of you. But at the same time, the development is coming. Our job is to manage the development and make sure it's a smart devel development and not done overly exceeding what the limitations of particular pieces of property allow. This property allows for development that is higher than what's being suggested. I do have concerns and did have concerns with the septic systems, but like I said earlier, if the state and the environmental health is gonna manage and, and oversee that, then I'm not here to usurp that over their, over their judgment. So I would be voting in favor of this particular application despite the fact of everyone and all of their concerns that are on here, which are definitely valid concerns. But I can tell you, I live in a neighborhood with a dead end street and there's kids playing in the road there. There's basketball hoops on the side of the street. It's just a fact of life. It's, it's not ideal for anyone, but my suggestion would be is if you don't like growth and you, and you don't want to have anything new coming in and around you, then you may want to leave the state of Florida. Any other comments? Mr. Chair. Yes, ma'am. Um, I agree with a lot of what Mr. Bramlett said. Um, the only thing that he <coughs> left out was that this particular property, um, by right, would be able to have 20 units on it because it's uh, four per acre. So with a parcel that's about five acres, they could develop by right that, that amount. So what we're looking at here is uh, 6.4 which or 6 point something, which is not even um, what they could go up to with a PUD at eight per, per acre. So um, I had questions too about a lot of parts of this application, but they were resolved during the discussion here. I still feel like when we talk about the compatibility, there are um, large parcel single family dwellings on this roadway surrounding this uh, proposed application. But um, my question would be, is this board, uh, for me, I don't think I would be willing to uh, allow the deviations from the buffers because I think that's what would protect the uh, residents in this area. I am in favor of the application, but not, not with that deviation. I mean, I could be talked into no wall, but I don't know about the deviation on the buffers. 
that would help to protect the residents. Any other comments? Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Um, regarding the buffers, um, unlike Ms. Cotu, I like walls. Okay, I think walls make good neighbors and they certainly deaden sound. Um, and I, I like uh, condition number seven as it's written uh, to conform to the land development code with a 25 foot type two buffer with a, with a wall every place that it's required. I would not be in favor of any deviation from that uh, condition. The other thing is I still think uh, parking is highly suspect with this, but I um, am supposed to allow that to happen during the zoning or the uh, permitting process. So uh, I'll pass on that. Uh, again, I, I don't think much of the sewer idea. If it was uh, equivalent, um, you know, it would be installed in larger cities that had central sewage systems. Um, I think when you're sharing a, a structure with somebody, it's hard enough to share a common wall, let alone utilities that uh, may or may not function or require cooperation from uh, next door neighbors who may not be cooperating. So I don't think it's equivalent. Uh, I don't think we care for it, but if the state has, uh, like Mr. Bramlett said, if the state says it's equivalent, so I guess at the end of the day, um, I too will support it, but only with uh, if, I, if condition number seven stays uh, unchanged. Thank you. Any other comments? <coughs> Mr. Faismeyer? Um, I think, I, first of all, I, I, I hear the comments of the, the neighbors in the area. Um, However, uh, as Commissioner Bramlett indicated, Citrus County is growing, um, and uh, I see a, a need for uh, additional housing. Maybe uh, everyone cannot afford, um, you know, a half million dollar home that you know some of the developers are building today. Um, the applicant has indicated that, to his knowledge, this is not Section Eight housing. This is not subsidized housing. It is um, housing that could be considered, in my opinion, um, workforce housing uh, that's been much discussed in this county recently. Uh, I think this may fit the need for that. May also fit the need for uh, occasional snowbirds uh, from time to time. So uh, I think in general, uh, this is a, um, uh, a good application or a good project. Uh, I intend to um, support it. Thank you. Any comments, Mr. Commissioner Barnes? Mr. Chair, I agree with everything that's been said by the, by the residents and by the board here. I have two conflicts that I have a problem with. One, I do not believe in the aerobic septic system, and I'm torn between trying to approve something that we're going to tie into something that I don't believe in. Irregardless what the state says, uh, the aerobic is still a septic. We've been working very hard for the last 10 years in this county to get away from septics and go to county sewer. And here we are, right back at a conversation, having this, uh, we created a new sewer system, a new septic system that's not gonna work. Uh, it's not been out long enough to even find out if it's environmental friendly. I agree with the buffers. I don't, uh, I think we should leave the buffer the way it is. Uh, it's hard for me to, I'll, I'm not in support of this application. I, I'm, I will turn it down because of the septic. I don't think there's enough recreational area after listening to Dr. Uh, Wilburn. Uh, I agree with the, the parking. I don't agree with the parking as far as, we. I think we all know that there's two spaces in front of a house. You're not gonna let your, your guy down the street's friend park in your front yard. Uh, so I think there's a problem with that. And that's a problem with the building code or land development code, so I, I don't necessarily agree with that uh, as well. But I'm not in support of this application, and I'm going to deny it as far as I'm concerned. Thank you. Any comments, Commissioner Scraggs? I have total conflict. I understand the need, and I don't think it, it fits. So after listening to everybody, I'm going to deny it. Thank you. Um, Mr. Commissioner, can I, yes, sir. Chairman, can I add one more thing? Absolutely, it, sir. 
and correct me if I'm wrong, and I, and I think Mr. Brandt will probably have an answer to this. The development that has so much problem there in sort of Section 8, that wasn't designed to be a Section 8 property, right? I, I don't it, have an answer it, to that question. It was later, uh, nine to nine months or so after it was built, it, my understanding, that's when it became a Section 8. So I was just curious about that too, but I couldn't find any record on that. I thought maybe you would because you've been here forever. Thank you. I mean, the only thing I would say about Section 8 housing is, is I feel like people, you know, it, it, it's, it's like a black eye, but at the same time, everybody, all we keep saying is, is, oh, we need to do something for the homelessness. We need to do something for the homelessness. But then as soon as somebody wants to come in there and say, oh, let's put some affordable housing in, then we have the entire neighborhood and everybody else running around saying, no, I don't want it there. Oh, well, we want to do something for homelessness but we don't want it right where we have to look at it. So where, where's the trade-off? I mean, we have some apartments in the community already. I saw the pictures from the gentleman from his wife from Miss Volusia County. Those are code compliance items. If that was happening in my neighborhood and there were cars on blocks and there was trash out there all over, I would call code compliance. That's who handles that stuff. If there's kids in the neighborhood and running around and getting on your property, then you deal with it like that you and sometimes it's easy just you know what hey knock on a door this is america like you can still talk to people i know that nobody wants to talk to people anymore but i'm in the communication business i sell real estate we talk to people all day long lots of times a lot of uh objections and 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 fights and just all of the animosity in general can just be dealt with with people that just decide to be humans and talk to each other we're all just humans people helping people every single day so whether this was Section 8 housing or not would not have a bearing on my decision or I just want people to know that. Um, yes, no. Joe. Mr. Chairman, I would just like to remind the board and the public that this is a recommendation. The motion today is a recommendation to the Board of County Commissioners. And so, you know. They have final say. Right. So this isn't necessarily the final say. It will also go to the Board of County Commissioners for approval. So there will be another public hearing. Thank you. Um, Can I just wrap up one more thing, too? I would like to say that um, I have zero issue with the conditions being deviated from. If Ms. Katu, as the land development director and the person that's been in charge of this stuff for the longest time, longer than I've been alive almost, is okay with it, <laughs> then I'm okay with it. Good thing she's not here. <laughs> that was definitely not meant derogatory. It was meant as complimentary because she has the vast amounts of experience and and uh, she she knows exactly what she's dealing with and what is and isn't compatible with areas. All right. Um, I have a couple issues with this uh, application. <coughs> uh, I have to agree with Commissioner Stone regarding parking. Our regulations may require 1.4 spaces per unit, but there are gonna be many of these that are gonna have two vehicles per unit and there's no visitor parking per se, as one of the other commissioners said. I'm not necessarily want to have somebody else park in front of my property because that's my set of spaces. So I don't think we've adequately addressed visitor parking. He may have more spaces than what's required uh, per our code, but I think that he's not addressing how visitors could really uh, access the parcel. I'm concerned with the access. Um, the county has indicated they would like to have the driveway opposite West Deer Trail Lane. Uh, if he does that, he said that he could, he would probably end up losing one unit. I think that there could be possibly more in order to make some, you know, decent geometry. So I think that's a negative in, in um, how the application looks. The sewer, um, sewer's not that far away. He did not, you know, he submitted the application without having all the information ahead of time in regards to the sewer, whether he could or could not meet the existing inverts at the two manholes. Um, I don't believe that we should be installing septic at this point in time. Also, if septic were to be installed, could these anaerobic systems actually require more space than what is shown? Could there be a decline in the number of units that are here or the layout may change because of it? Um, there's no idea, at least I don't see anything on here as far as they're going to be um, a central collection for uh, trash. If so, where is it going to be? How is it going to fit into all of the homes? Um, the active recreation is very minimal, uh, or was actually zero. 
And he said during his presentation, he said, well, I'm going to have it in front of the houses and behind the houses. I don't think that addresses how we want to look at recreation in these developments. I think the idea of this application isn't bad, but I think there's a lot of tweaking that should be done, and I think that this application um, could have a little more fine tuning done to it before it became uh, before it came from in front of us. Um, based on what I see and what I've heard, I'm not going to be in favor of this application. And with that, I think everybody has expressed their concerns, their issues. Any other comments or issues? I'll just say he did say there would be trash pickup, so I, I don't know. There would be trash pickup, yes, but he didn't indicate is it going to be a central trash pickup or is it going to be in front of each home? I just, you know, just to me, first I feel like he didn't address everything, but he did say something. Yes, you are right. Any other comments? With that, we have a motion either for or against or a continuation, whatever the commission pleases. We have the conditions. We made some changes. Setback structures is 40 feet from the center line. That's yes. what you have? Correct. So as discussed, the amendments would be to condition three. It would say the setback for structures is 40 feet from the center line of North Pinecone Avenue and North Brandywine Terrace, and then stop there. Um, if we do the buffer condition, that would be number seven. It would say a 15-foot type D buffer is required along the northeast and west property line. And then number 11 would be modified to say sidewalks shall be installed on at least one side of the main driveway. Or without a wall. Yeah, right. No wall on condition number seven, unless the board wants it. Right. Well, what I've heard is that, that, that they do want that, that a 25 type D buffer with a wall. Let me say that I'll vote against this if we delete that section. <coughs> I'm already sitting the borderline now, and Richard has uh, made some pretty good arguments. So uh, if we go ahead and delete uh, item number seven, uh, I'll definitely vote against this. So, so, so tell me, so tell me uh, how you would like uh, item seven to read. Just like no change. No Just change. Okay. Okay. All right. So. I'm okay with that. All right, so we all, all right, so condition three, we, it appears we have no issue with. Condition 11, we have no issue with. So condition seven, um, it appears that we want to leave it as a 25 foot type D buffer with wall, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's correct? no we, there's a few. A few, yes. all right. Yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm okay with what the staff said. Okay, and just for clarification purposes, so the 15 foot, I believe, stems from the reduction in the setback that they're requesting. So it would be 25 outside of those buildings, but where those buildings have a reduced setback, that's where the 15 comes from, unless I misheard that. So it would be 15 feet wide where the building encroaches within the, you know, to the 40 foot setback as opposed to the 50 and then it would be 25 for the remainder of the site. With no wall. With what I think he's saying is we need 15 foot with a wall. Well, it's in order to not encroach on the right. With or way. without the wall is is up to the board. Right. It's it's the distance. So if we do the 40 foot setback for the structures, that's 15 feet from the edge of the property. So you can't get the full 25. Correct where the building is, but everywhere else you can get the full yeah, 25. Yeah, the long runs, you could get it on the sides, you could Right, so just for clarification purposes, even with the 25 foot width, it would still be 15 where that building encroaches into the setback. Which is on the sides, Pine Cone and Brandywine. Correct. So if that's the case, should we revise that condition so it's very specific that the 15 foot type D buffer would be on the west and east side and 25 foot type D with a wall on the remainder of the property. So there's no questions down the road. Are, are we deleting the wall on the 15 foot setback? No. Oh, so we have the wall in all cases. So it is with wall. The walls would be in all cases. Okay. All right. And just there would be 15 foot on the east side, west side, and 25 foot north and south. Or it could, even, it could be 15 feet just where that building goes into the setback. Yes. Is that? So it'd be a 25 foot type D buffer with a wall 
it's just it would be with the understanding that where the buildings encroach within there it would obviously have to be a slightly smaller okay are we good with that what did you say at the end? It kind of <laughs> went, Ugh. <laughs> it would it would be a twenty five foot wide type D buffer with a wall, with the understanding that where the buildings encroach within the setback, the forty foot, that buffer would have to be reduced slightly to to fit. Yes, I'm okay. Okay. All right. With that. You have it written the right way. We have everything under control now. Yes, yes. All right. Okay. Do we have a motion? Yes, Mr. Chair. The Planning and Development Commission finds application number 22-04 consistent with the Citrus County Comprehensive Plan and Citrus County Land Development Code and that this board recommends approval with conditions of the application to the Board of County Commissioners based upon the evidence and testimony presented and the staff report and conclusions regarding this petition. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, we have a first from Commissioner Worthington and a second from Commissioner Facemeyer with uh, a few minor changes to the conditions. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. 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 Ooh. Can we do a roll call, please? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Bass? Opposed. Ms. Worthington? Uh, yes. Mr. Barnes? Opposed. Mr. Bramblett? Opposed. Mr. Facemeyer? For. Mr. Stone? For. Ms. Scragg? Opposed. Thank you. Motion uh, fails 4-3 uh, in denial. I would like to mention the only reason I voted no is because I don't like the conditions and we all know that the Board of County Commissioners will do what they say fit, so I'd like that added to the record. So noted. And with that, that concludes our two, I guess I was headed to that. <laughs> that concludes our two applications for today. And before we start the um, uh, presentations, uh, we're going to take a break until 11 o'clock. That's about eight minutes or so. I have cleaned that as soon as the meeting started today. <laughs> So we have um, OA-22-04 LDC updates for Cardinal Street Interchange Management Area presented by Wade Trim. Do we have a representative or yes, representatives or do we have the entire company with us today to, to enlighten Not us? Not quite, though. Not too far off, though. Uh, thank you, sir. So my name is Brad Cornelius. I am with Wade Trim. Yep. Uh, my role with Wade Trim, I'm vice president, and I'm also the lead for Florida planning with Wade Trim. So uh, we're here with you this evening, or this morning, actually, <laughs> afternoon, whatever it is. It's moving along. So yes, we have part of our team here with you this e today. I'll just say today. Uh, first is, and I'll just introduce real quick, this is Amanda Warner with Wade Trim. She's actually the project manager for this project, so she'll be doing a lot of the presentation. I'm just kind of doing the front stuff. And then we have our team members here. We have Chris Dunn with Wanamaker Jensen Architects. He's helping us as well with this project related to the, the building design and issues like that. And then Lynn Bellinger is here, but she hasn't come back in yet. Lynn is with RMA, and she's doing the economic development. So the report that you referenced, that was the work that Lynn had done, is, is what Lynn is. So that's our team. We have us as the planners. We have Chris and his group as the architects, and we have Lynn as the economic development folks. And we're all here this afternoon with you all. <coughs> so very quickly to say, so what we're here doing with you all this afternoon is we're just presenting the very first work product that's coming out. That's why this is a workshop. You're not approving anything. You're not necessarily denying anything. This is for us to get any feedback and comments you all have about what we've had so far. Um, so we can then incorporate that. Once we get your feedback, then we'll be going to the Board of County Commissioners do the same thing with them, get their feedback on what we have, also tell them what you all say to us today. And then once that happens, then we're gonna go back out to the public. Amanda will give you more in terms of timing how this all happened, get more feedback, and then ultimately come forward with the actual ordinance for your consideration. So the important point is we're still in the development process. Any comments you all have, the Board of County Commissioners have, or any residents or business owners or any interested party have, bring. We wanted to hear them.
because we want to be sure that we address the most that we can. So I just want to make sure everybody understands that this is a work session to get comments, not to make a decision at this point. That's all I have to say, and I will turn it over to Amanda. Be before before yes, you sir. do that, Brad, I have one question. Um, this board, several years ago, over maybe a, a couple years, we went through many, many workshops with uh, Michael Sherman, who's no, no longer with the county. Yes, sir. Can you uh, explain to us what's different about what we did then and what we're doing now? What, what's happened, and Amanda will talk about this, but I'll do it real quick and she'll say it better than I will. So what you did then is still pretty much what you're doing now. So what's happening is that set, that's where we started from, is the, all the work that you had done previously. So what we're taking that is now we're going, particularly here on Cardinal, is we're taking the comprehensive plan amendment for Cardinal area that was already adopted, it's already been through, now we're doing the implementation side. We're writing the zoning code to implement it. So the work that you had previously done on Cardinal with Mr. Sherman, it got you to the comprehensive plan, and now we're taking it to the next step, working with your staff now, um, to now do the implementation with the zoning side of it. On State Road 44, that one wasn't as far as along. Right. So today, what, what I'll present to you is the State Road 44 proposed comprehensive plan language. And then once that gets okay from everyone, then we'll come back to you all with the zoning as well with that. So basically what we're doing now is we're implementing what you all started before. That's, that's the, the short story. Thank you. Yes, sir. So um, as Brad mentioned, I'm Amanda Warner. I'm a planner with Wade Trim, consultant for the Board of County Commissioners. Um, I am here today to go over the Cardinal Street IMA land development code updates, the administrative draft. As Brad had mentioned, we're just in the drafting phase at this point. So uh, this is a workshop to discuss the administrative draft. We're going to workshop it with you and then take it to the Board of County Commissioners, workshop it with them, and then we'll go out for another public involvement campaign with that draft, whatever the outcome of that is. So we'll make modifications between now, these workshops, we'll make modifications to the draft and then put it out for public comment. We will be holding an open house and some other public involvement activities uh, at that time. That's anticipated probably within the next few months. So I think you were wondering maybe about timing of this. So we're doing the workshopping now. Probably in the next month or two, we'll be advertising that next public workshop. So. All right, so a little bit of background, and I think Brad just covered this uh, with your question. How did we get here? So the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council in 2019 published a study, essentially, of the effect of the Suncoast Parkway extension on Citrus County and offered in that basically three potential scenarios for growth. Um, at that time, the Board of County Commissioners uh, selected the focused growth scenario. Um, it was neither uh, no growth nor um, uh, fast growth, uh, but it was focused growth. So this is a moderated or mitig mitigated growth scenario. Um, in 2020, that's when the uh, county held public meetings to identify the growth management policy preferences. That was the public meeting cycle that preceded the development of the comprehensive plan amendment, which then uh, happened in 2021. So the county amended uh, the comprehensive plan to add the cardinal mixed use future land use category in early 2021. After that, uh, we started looking at uh, the development of the land development code updates to implement that comprehensive plan amendment. So that's where we are in 2022. That project started late 2021, early 2022, and that's where we are today. So where is Cardinal Street and what is the Cardinal Street IMA? So uh, just south of here, Cardinal Street runs east-west. And the Cardinal Street IMA is shown in the red boundary on your screen. And what's important to note about this is under the Comprehensive Plan Amendment or the CMU Amendment for the Cardinal Street mixed use area, there were two sub areas to the Cardinal Street IMA. One was the economic development target area, which is shown in a turquoise or green color. I'm not sure how it's, it's showing up to you, but um, that is the economic development target area portion, which is directly abutting the interchange. And then if you look at the remainder, the balance of the area outlined in red, that is what we call the mixed use sub area. So there are different land uses, uh, different development standards uh, suggested for each of these sub areas. So I just want to draw that distinction up front 
that there are two sub, sub areas with um, different standards accordingly. So public engagement, as I mentioned, this process started back in early 2022. Uh, back in, I think it was February or March, we initiated a project website. What I wanted to point out on this is, although it's not a large sample size, uh, reaction to the project itself was mixed. Um, that's how I describe it. You can see on the screen from the pie chart there that about half are in favor, half are concerned about it, and then we have some, some neutral folks. Um, <coughs> of the um, ranking of what outcomes people would like to see, preserving the character of the community was ranked number one. Um, after that was improved pedestrian mobility safety. And I know from the public workshops that we had, we did hear a lot, a lot about public safety on the street in terms of walking, crossing, um, perhaps pets, worried about pets um, being out on the road um, because of the cardinal uh, street character. Um, what type of development was one of the questions we asked and the responses that were submitted were also mixed. So we had maintained current character, no development, uh, a lot of folks wanted a mix, a multi-use trail, green space, sidewalks, a widened road, so this plays into the public safety concerns. Um, more trees for a barrier, workforce housing or homes, apartment complexes and townhomes in support of that workforce housing or homes, and then job creating businesses. Um, there was uh, some suggestion of rest areas with truck parking, gas stations, restaurants, and commercial. So these were, this is summarizing the responses that we received through the public works website uh, when we asked what type of double element would you like to see in this area. So our first stakeholder meeting was fe held February 9th uh, and it was held at, right here in this room. We had about 20 participants attend. We provided an overview of the project. So this is right when we were kicking off the project. We asked about several dis different aspects of the corridor. So what were the assets and challenges? What were the expectations and concerns? And then what development pattern design people would like to see? We also talked a little bit about economic opportunities. And I know there's a lot of words up there on the screen, but the summary is there were concerns about ca compatibility. There was also a concern about the lack of infrastructure. So utilities, the width of the road, stormwater, um, uh, master stormwater system perhaps, uh, concern about that not being out there. Um, some of the assets were really large tracts of land, the current rural character, the proximity to US 19, and that new Suncoast Parkway access as an opportunity. Um, lots of people were looking at this perhaps as a gateway to the county, um, but that would be balanced with some design standards, mixed use, attempts to reduce sprawl, and other employment opportunities. Um, again, many of the concerns were the same as the challenges. And then in development and design, looking at really a human scale project, um, easy to use, navigate it, and then some classic design. Um, economic opportunities. We heard uh, a lot about tying in with the Suncoast Parkway and the opportunity that was bringing. So for example, um, a corporate office, maybe vehicle fueling, uh, things that would be popular with a commuter, uh, com commuter user. And then um, definitely no adult businesses, heavy industrial noise, smell nu nuisances, and truck stops. Um, some of the economic opportunities we saw a tie in with perhaps some of the medical and retirement services that are valued here, um, RV parks, distribution centers, and colleges and trade schools as being some ec economic tie ins. So that was just a summary of the input that we received at that first stakeholder meeting. And then we held our first public open house on February 23rd at the Homosassa Public Library. 40 participants were in, in attendance. We had informational handouts, comment forms, and activity stations. Again, we asked some of the same questions. What are the assets, challenges, expectations, and concerns, and the development pattern design preferences? We heard a lot of the same things we did at the stakeholder meeting. So the rural character, dark skies, nice place to retire, preservation of wildlife and farmland, and then same concerns public safety, traffic safety, lack of infrastructure. Those were all things that, that were concerns. Um, the expectations were really things to address those challenges. So pedestrian safety, connectivity, improved utilities, variety of housing, and then places to uh, get food and fuel, uh, tie-ins with the Suncoast Parkway. Um, and then the development pattern design, um, development that mitigates walkable development, affordable workforce housing, everyday services. So people were really, really looking for those things that you'd find in your neighborhood, things that you could easily get to or walk to. And then again, looking at the rural design, low profile development, and um, one of the things we heard was some parking in front of building. 
So in addition to those two uh, public outreach, so both the stakeholder meeting and the first public open house, um, RMA, Redevelopment, Mar um, excuse me, Re Redevelopment Management Associates, RMA, prepared a market analysis for the area, specifically the area shown in red on that uh, map that I showed you previously. So the market analysis report covered Cardinal Street IMA and the basic conclusions were that intermediate sized business parks catering to the needs of the region, healthcare and business and service professions were probably uh, the desirable use here. Suited to, the area is suited to carefully planned commerce park with a campus environment, light industrial or commercial uses. The healthcare sector is an opportunity, uh, perhaps a mixed use lifestyle light industrial market, technology and co-working, and the commercial market, retail and automotive near interchange. So again, the gas stations convenience first, followed by restaurants, and then the need for design guidelines, complete streets um, as being really critical to the preservation of that community character. So those are, that's just a really high level summary of the market analysis. I believe the market analysis was provided in your packet if you wanna look at that in more detail, but, but those were the basic key points that, that came out of that. Um, and just as a reminder, in the, um, in the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council study that was done back in 2019, where the focus growth scenario was selected by the county, the focus of that EDTA area, or the economic uh, development um, target area there, was really light industrial, maybe some of these more parkway related uses as economic or employment generators. So um, this is really feeding into uh, what was originally recommended by that study and then again confirmed through RMA's analysis. So the administrative draft of the land development code update. So in your packet you have a copy of the administrative draft. Again, this is a rough draft of the land development code uh, taking into consideration the input that we've heard to date. And I wanna go over the key sections of that land development code draft. So first of all, it relocates portions of chapter seven interchange management areas to chapters two and three of the land development code. Chapter seven already included a section regarding interchange management areas. It's where basically uh, these areas were parked prior to uh, this uh, project to incorporate them into their own sections. So that's where sections are moved from. So that's chapter seven interchange management areas. We can try, try to incorporate what was in chapter seven and then improve on that as we move them over into chapter two and chapter three accordingly. So chapter two land use districts adds Cardinal mixed use or the CMU district to the, to the menu of land use districts. It establishes the EDTA and mixed use area and it establishes the uses and area requirements there under. So we're talking about impervious surface ratio, floor area ratio, density, open space requirements, et cetera. Um, and then chapter three use standards is where we go into uh, the true purpose and intent of the CMU district. It provides the process for implementation and applicability of the CMU, and then refers to per permitted and prohibited uses that are identified in chapter two. It also establishes specific development standards. So that's an overview of the key sections and where areas were moved to and, or excuse me, from and to uh, in this new draft. So the highlights. So the CMU district or the Cardinal Mixed Use District would be implemented by a comprehensive plan amendment and by plan unit development, so CPA and PUD. So vested lots are not required to conform to the CMU unless the, um, so the trigger for this is if a property owner applies for a comprehensive plan amendment and a plan unit development. So it would not go into effect until the property owner actually applied to do this. Um, it codifies minimum development size. So if you recall in the original uh, comprehensive plan amendment for the CMU, there was a minimum eight acre aggregation for areas in the EDTA and there was a minimum 18 acre aggregation for areas in the mixed use area. So this actually codifies those and how they are um, aggregated in the process for aggregation. It also provides separate site development and building architectural standards for the EDTA um, versus the mixed use area. So this is just a summary. Of course, there, there's um, many more standards in the draft that you're looking at. However, in the EDTA, we're, we are proposing an ISR of 70% uh, or per PUD, so that could be negotiated during the PUD process with a maximum FAR of 1.0. 
We're also proposing a maximum height of 40 feet, two stories. And there's a, um, a, a little more fine detail in the draft to that in that the maximum height from uh, the ground to the start of the roof line is 30 feet, and then the maximum overall height is 40 feet. So there's a little more nuance to that, but overall height would be limited to 40 feet, two stories. And the mixed use area, so we're talking about not the green or turquoise area on that map, but the balance of the, of the area within the red boundary. Uh, we're looking at an impervious surface ratio or ISR of 60% or per, per PUD, so that could be negotiated as well. And then an FAR of uh, maximum of 0 0.5. And then unique to the mixed use area uh, as opposed to the EDTA, is there would be a minimum open space requirement of 20% or per PUD. Uh, the density minimum would be six dwelling units per acre and the density maximum would be 20 dwelling units per acre. And then there are two different height standards. So if horizontal mixed use is proposed, it would be a maximum of 40 feet, two stories. If vertical mixed use is proposed, it would be a maximum of 50 feet, three stories. However, if um, if they are choosing to go up to the 50 feet three stories, they have to step back the uppermost story by at least 10 feet from the front facade line of the, the story below it. So there is some um, provision in there for stepping back that uppermost story so that it's not quite um, as much of a vertical visual impact. So the organization of the development standards, um, there's really uh, the sections are A through F, and it starts with the site development standard. So this is where we talk about um, setbacks and so forth. And then we get into uh, building and architectural standards is where we talk about height and character, architectural character. Uh, we have a section for parking, transit, and bicycle pedestrian access because we heard a lot about that during the um, public involvement campaign. And then we have an open space requirement section, a utilities requirement section, and an environmental and historic cultural resources section. The utility section does require that any development coming in under the CMU district has to be connected to central water uh, and sewer, so there is that utility requirement in there. And that's consistent with the comprehensive plan amendment uh, for the CMU as well. And so we've provided in your packet just a couple examples of how, um, how this could be developed. These are concepts only just for, um, in order to put it into some visual terms because I know often when we look at development standards, it, it's hard to visualize what that would actually look like on the ground. There are two concepts here for the EDTA. One is a central access off of Cardinal Street. Um, and then you'll see the buildings uh, therein uh, and parking therein. We are proposing a 75 foot setback from the center line of Cardinal Street in the EDTA, a 50 foot setback from the center line of any adjacent local road, and then a 50 foot setback from the um, any adjacent property, uh, not necessarily a, a road. And then in the bottom uh, scenario, we have uh, several access points. So we have really a main access point off of Cardinal, but then we have some access points to local or adjacent uh, local streets. And then in that scenario, we have the same setbacks as well. So 75 foot from the center line of Cardinal Street, 50 foot from any um, adjacent local road, and then 50 feet from any adjacent parcel behind it. Uh, in the center of that graphic, you'll see some uh, concepts of what the buildings would look like from the side or profile view uh, based on that standard um, and then also some massing over to the right in terms of how that looks like uh, built up so this is basically the site plan shown on the left carried through to um, a, a profile view and then and then a massing view as well so that would be the ETD, EDTA, and I want to point out that the EDTA is limited to non-residential uses so this would really be transportation related uses, light industrial, um, office, et cetera, uh, in the EDTA, consistent with the uh, comprehensive plan amendment, as well as the recommendations of that Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council study. And then the mixed use. So we have a couple of scenarios for this as well, just as uh, um, concepts. So the top one, you'll see a what, what we're calling a horizontal mixed use scenario. So um, this would be, um, you know, the, the uses are spread out across the property rather on top of each other. Um, and then we have uh, a different setbacks for this as well. 
Um, this is 75 feet uh, from the center line of Cardinal in the front, 50 feet on the side, and then a reduced setback to 20 feet uh, to adjacent properties. This is to improve connectivity with adjacent pro properties in terms of walkability or connectivity. So if somebody wanted to um, head up to the corner store, they'd be able to access it a little bit easier. Um, and then in the center, we have uh, profiles of this in terms of, of the height um, and how that Cardinal st uh, Street center line would, would appear, as well as the adjacent road center line and the adjacent property. And then on the far right, we have the massing diagram for the same thing. So again, carried through just as examples. On the bottom, you'll see a vertical mixed use scenario. So the uses uh, in this case would be um, on top of each other. So uh, you can envision a neighborhood commercial, something like that on the first floor, and then moving up to maybe an office or a residence on, on the top floor there. Um, and then we have the profiles of that and a massing diagram as well of that, of that scenario. And I want to point out that both of these scenarios incorporate the 20% open space uh, in there as well. So you'll see a central courtyard. It doesn't have to be in this configuration. These, again, are just examples, but just showing uh, incorporation of, of a an open space or a park in the center. And with that, um, I'm available to answer any questions. I know that was, was a lot, and I know there's a lot in the LDC so draft, so if there's anything I can help clarify, please let me know. Thank you. Any comments or questions from this commission? Yeah. Yes, Ms. Worthington. What's the process if aggregate, aggregation can't happen? So what if they can't do the 8 and 18 acres? Yeah, so if they can't do the 8 and 18 acres, um, there, there's really they'd have to do the minimum 8 and they'd have to do the minimum 18 unless they were adjacent to another um, property that had aggregated and they had direct access to that property. And then they could join uh, that way. So if they have 7.95, they, mm -hmm. they they can't do a PUD or something like that? or They would have to be located adjacent to another property that aggregated and came in under the CMU district. So there is a provision in there for if they can't meet the aggregation requirement, if they are immediately adjacent to and connect, can connect into that, then they can, can go ahead and do the CMU. What was the thought process behind a minimum acreage of eight in the EDTA? That I'm not privy to. I know that was done. Um, I don't know, Joe. Do you have an answer for that? Yeah. That was ju that was something that was discussed during the Cardinal Mixed Use Comp Plan Amendment, mm -hmm. and they had um, Mike and Steve Blocknick had come up with some minimum acreage requirements. I believe initially it was 10 and 20, 10 and EDTA, 20 yeah. mixed use, and then the Board of County Commissioners revised it. They went with uh, 8 and 18, so that's what they chose. So. For me, when I think about what type of businesses would go around an interchange you know, area, would be like a gas station or something like that. And are they likely, are typically gas stations purchasing eight acres minimum to, to locate? Lynn, do you have any information about that gas station location? Okay. All right, yeah. yeah so we'll have to research that and get it back to you about it for the minimum gas station side. I think what, I think what happens Actually, is... as I recall, Michael, Michael Sherman kind of... Uh, Discourage that, as I recall. I think only, only adjacent to the on and off ramps in the EDT area. That's where that. I'm talking about the EDT area. Yeah. That's where that kind of stuff is allowed. We had a, we had a big debate over the size of the parcels there because of gas stations and and thinking that they would need a smaller area than that eight acres. I think you're right. <laughs> yeah, that was Michael Sherman's vision of. Um, I can't remember the name of the community that he Tioga something of Tioga or whatever and so that I, was that was where he he had seen and that was like the overall vision and I remember being adamantly opposed to it I wasn't exactly sure what you can put me down as adamantly opposed to it also I, I think we were actually had talked that we we thought it'd be somewhere closer to around five acres I thought is what you know came up that three that to five it it might have been three to five but it was definitely smaller than but, but eight. I thought the large acreage wasn't specifically intended to keep gas stations and 7-Elevens and, yes. 
and little convenience stores and all that little crap development that you see at every interchange. That's what they okay. didn't want. That's Why what they wouldn't were you want a gas station off of an that's interchange? Well, you so could get a gas station, but you ain't going to get it there. You have to do it as part of the larger because development. Because the intention was not to have that kind of development at the Cardinal. Mi if you want that, go down to 44 or go farther back to 98. Well, well, I can't speak to the exact process for deciding on the eight acres specifically. I believe the overall intent of the Cardinal Mixed Use District in general from the comprehensive plan process was to encourage larger master plan site development so that you get more of that character and more of that, um, more of the uh, interaction of uses instead of having um, small properties develop each one by one and then you have a bunch of hodgepodge development out there it was really to encourage an overall master planned site so that you can have gas station uses on that in pairing with other uses as well that are complementary to that and Brad if you wouldn't no, that's okay Is that what saying? so um, I think that was the vision behind having that in the comprehensive plan amendment I think is to encourage that overall master planning in a larger site uh, menu of uh, uses on that property rather than one use at a time coming in, which is, I think was the concern of this developing so rapidly. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, one, one thing I, I'll say is um, we will definitely take this away and write this down and come back when we come back to you have more information about that. So that would be one of these things. As we said, we're looking for the feedback. So we understand, you know, just hearing what I heard, it's not, not everybody on the board thinks this, but that's okay. So what we will do is we will go back and make sure we'll look at the, that 8 and 18. We'll have that information for you. Um, because I will, I'll jump ahead a little bit. You'll see in 44, we actually did not stick to that. We actually went to a smaller size. Right. And I just but, but we will look at that and, and have, have more information for you. And I just want to say those acreages are already in the comp plan for the right. CMU district. So they're, they're in there. So this is taking what's already in the comp plan and then building yeah, right, right. We're yeah. not changing right. that. So right. the, the, what they'll look for then is the gas station and then with the all together, you know, you'll see the gas station, Cracker Barrel, hotel. Correct. Yeah, right. Correct. Yes. Correct. Correct. So it would be a larger master plan site with yeah. more attention to um, circulation within the site and so forth rather than having um, separate parcels that are all disconnected along the roadway. I think that was, th that was the intent originally. Although I suppose mm -hmm. on the other hand you could get a Transamerica – giant mm -hmm. truck stop there that would meet that criteria. Right. Mm -hmm. you know, then you or a Bucky's. Well, it says no truck stops. <laughs> <laughs> no truck Bucky's. stops. But uh, mm -hmm. one thing, we have the uh, your development uh, tied to uh, connection to a central uh, sewer system. And uh, you may want to uh, define that a bit more carefully because we get, uh, most recently, uh, we get a lot of... Um, interpretation of that, of these packaged septic systems that are supposedly equivalent to central sewer, uh, and if you don't want a lot of separate little package systems, you may want to define that a little bit more carefully. It says the same thing, but we just heard. I, I think that's a good idea to make sure that we Clearly address how we want to handle septic in because that needs to be defined. No, it's got to it's got to be central. Sewer. Yeah, well, right. right but if, if, if according, <laughs> but if according to what we heard earlier today that the anaerobic systems could be considered as a central sewer, right. is that what we want? I don't think so. Exactly. I think we so want. That's why I'm saying they need to define exactly what they yes. want and what we don't want. Right. That would be also good to put in. What um, don't you want? When I'm looking at your you um, draft here, mm -hmm. yes. there's a there there's it's there's a section for EDTA and then there's a section for mixed use and mm -hmm. then here yeah, just, on page 27 and 28, have, oh I guess that's where we get to the right, building the and architectural system. standards and yeah. then yeah. it's talking yeah. about yeah. for the yeah. EDTA architectural styles and facades we're going to be dictating what types of facades build buildings must have in that area? Yes, yeah, so part of the part of the comments that we heard from the public were, were keeping everything in character with what's out there. So part of having an architectural character standard there is to keep it consistent with what the adjacent properties are, having a consistent plan for 
a site. So for example, if a site comes in to apply for a PUD, each building would be consistently designed in terms of its appearance, its exterior appearance, and instead of having several different architectural styles. And how are these styles defined? Um, so these styles were defined through the public input process. So this is what we heard from people in terms of examples of what they were looking at. We heard a lot about old Florida vernacular. We heard um, uh, Citrus Avenue is an example of the type of character, um, which is really that old Florida downtown look. Um, so that's why we applied those specific standards. And then I think, mm -hmm. yeah. Chris, mm -hmm. could, you, could you help with this question about the architectural yeah. styles? We'll bring architect up, but talk about architectural styles. Yeah, Amanda, she, she expressed it pretty well, but um, I know that uh, when you try to codify a style, it's very difficult. I mean, it's, well, who's under whose it's, interpretation? It's, it's, it's I an mean. interpretation. It's an interpretation. Uh, I believe, as Amanda said, we are trying to uh, recognize the character of the environment that we're building in here. And also the sensibilities of the community, the people who live here, they have their s certain sensibilities. And I think we can glean from their responses a type of, a, a direction in which to go. So we're just trying to provide a direction. Mm -hmm. I know that once these projects are actually built, they'll probably have a design review board that will go through all these nuances as far as style and everything. And that will be open to, should be open to the public as far as uh, suggestions. Are at that we point. the design review board um, also then? I don't know. Is that? Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. So, so the way it's currently structured, that would be part of the PUD submission that would come to you all for okay. a review. Um, you would have the staff recommendation and review of it as well when it comes to you. As, as Chris said, you know, how it's currently in, in what you see before you, it gives you, oh, I'm sorry, the names of the different architectural styles, which are quite honestly pretty common. Those right. are pretty common here. And then there's not really a whole lot of very specifics of what it needs to be. There's a thing about fenestration, which I've learned recently means windows and doors. Um, it has, you know, a minimum of that. It talks about canopies. But there's still a lot of flexibility in what that ultimately would look like. I think what the direction that we were given coming into this was we want to put a design standard in that is complementary of the county and what the county is and, and, the, and the story of the county. We just don't want anything just to pop up on the sides of these roadways at these major, now these interchanges. So that's the intent of that. Again, I think the way currently it is, it's, it's, it is absolutely open to interpretation. Ultimately, it's going to be up to your board and the Board of County Commissioners if a project comes through to say, do they meet that intent with the support of staff with their review? So, at the end of the day, I don't believe, I don't believe you have a design review board currently within in the county. We're not proposing that you create one either, is what we're doing. Now, if you believe that's important to do, we can absolutely consider that. So, but when they submit their site plans, then they will have to have more extensive development and site plans presented. The They'd have the renderings of the building, the building type, the style. Yes, ma'am. Any other comments from commissioners? Any comments from the public regarding? Well, I'm sorry. I oh. have just one more. Um, and then, again, building materials. We're dictating building materials as Generally, well. Generally, yep. Yeah, general building materials, yep. But yeah. we, we do that already. No, we don't. Yes, we do. The Florida we, Building Code. We dictate the material. facades and stuff like that, though, where it has to have, you can't have, like, metal structures, and it has to have the breakups and all that, whatever. The, I don't know what they're called, the sconches or whatever. Right. We have our large we and small non-res standards, yeah. and it does limit materials in some sense, as in no metal, you know, cor like corrugated metal facades Correct. and stuff like that. Not necessarily for the construction of it, just for the facade. <clears throat> Yeah, not the construction. Right, for the, you're talking about the, the facade, though. Code. Right, right, right. Facade. This is not, right, the, the materials here are <coughs> the, the facade, not okay. the sticks and stones that build the What structure. we see is what we're controlling. Absolutely, absolutely. As you said, the Florida Building Code c controls what, what holds everything else. What happens inside. Yes, sir. Okay. Attorney Stilwell. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good. I have just two comments, and they're um, 
they don't go to specific text. The one's just informational. You asked the size of a gas station. In the city of Inverness, I recently did a project for that company that starts with a W. <laughs> and uh, we, uh, we looked at the size of each W, WW in the county. The largest was three acres, the smallest was 1.8 acres, and there were two at 2.4, 2.4 and 2.6 for that use. I just passed that on as informational. And then the comment about central sewer, we have an existing definition, it's in your future land use element. Uh, you may not like it, but the comp plan since 1990 has defined central sewer and water, and central sewer is a DEP permitted system that serves more than two parcels and has a licensed operator. That is the comp plan definition. It's been there that long. I just passed it along for informational purposes. Thank you. Thank we, don't, you. we don't like that. But I know. <laughs> maybe, I know. It's, maybe it's time we look at that section yeah, of yes, the comp plan and you make know, an edit. You, you may be right, Mr. Bass. <laughs> uh, but I also would point out, and you know that, uh, that the county has run uh, major lines in this right of way for the Sun Coast. And uh, we talked about, if you remember on this project, adding the big large parcel to the west, which would then trigger a lift station in Central Sewer. So you got to keep all of that in the context. Thanks. Yeah. Any other comments from the public? Gaston Hall representing the Citrus County Building Alliance. Only thing we can say about your cardinal IMA is you've created a dead zone. Most of your Wawa's or any of your restaurant chains or stuff like that, they will not come in and build on that property without requirements for residential. So until we change the comp plan, which then will change the LDC, you're just, it's a, it's a dead zone. And that's RUR out there that's been there, so that's a totally different animal than 44, which is a lot of GNC. But like I say, we, we warned you all in the past, we warned them that when you start doing minimum acreages, start doing residential requirements on commercial, you, you've just moved off a lot of your national chains that would come in here and build. So this just further takes it even further away from what you'll get. The national chains now are very specific. They're very picky. If they can't do this on this, they go somewhere else. And that's just the way it is. And there's all places all over Florida competing. You can go to Miami, you can go to Coral Springs, some of the nicest neighborhoods, and you see the Cracker Barrel's there, you see the Wawa's there, it's their designs. It's not the county's designs because they want them there so they accept that. We didn't. And they're really, outside of a few areas, there's no places that have residential requirements on, on a commercial site so that the commercial entity has to build residence and they maintain them, rent them, or, or whatever on the commercial site. So hopefully we'll learn a lesson from Cardinal and not duplicate it on 44. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? Any other comments from commissioners? Yes, I have another question. Um, the open space requirements, recently um, we made a change where uh, stormwater retention areas will be considered in, as part of open space. And I see that these requirements here are uh, excluding stormwater retention areas from the, um, you know, getting to that 20%. And um, also, you know, one of the things when, when, when that change was made, we discussed, you know, you know, not that we weren't doing that as for them to be considered, the, the, the stormwater drainage areas to be considered um, functionally usable by the residents from the development. You know, that wasn't the thought process there. It was that we had PUDs and they had large acreage accounting for open space and um, they they weren't quite able to make make that 20% threshold so it but it, but it is still here in, in this interchange management area yeah so that'll be another part we'll, we'll take a look at we'll look at what you changed on the rest of your code and and we'll bring that forward in that discussion mm -hmm. so thank you for, for raising that issue for us any others um, I went through all of it. I've written down several notes. I'd like to give you the, the whole 
sections so you can read them all instead of Absolutely. You taking time to discuss Absolutely. each one. All right, awesome. We'll do that after we're finished. The yep. uh, and if you like to, um, if you want to, uh, to all the board members and, and staff, if you want to send anything after tonight today, please do so. Just please, you know, make sure staff gets it as well. Because and I will tell you, your staff is fantastic. Um, we really, really we know. We know. Well, <laughs> we're very grateful Joanna's for our staff. Here. That's what I can say because Joe's fantastic. <laughs> um, no, Joanne is fantastic too. But, uh, but please, yeah, today, absolutely, we're always wanting to hear the comment and feedback because, like we said, we're still in the drafting stage. So, absolutely. Um, All right. Good. Oh, uh, yeah, Mr. Chairman, just one, one comment. Just completely respect the comment from um, the billing folks. Um, in the EDTA, though, just so everybody is clear, that there's not a requirement for residential in the EDTA area. It's not even allowed use. Right, it's not allowed. <laughs> so, so the, the EDTA right. is only non residential. Only, right. So pure commercial. Pure commercial, uh, right. Or, yeah. in, or, right. Office, light industrial. Right, yeah. right, right. Yeah. So there, there will be no, requ there, there, right. there's no requirement but what for are residential. The, what are the chance? I mean, is it typical and is there a chance that these businesses are going to aggregate in that EDTA to form that acreage requirement? Hi, I'm Lynn Dellinger, and I worked on the market analysis for this project. So the, the Cardinal Street IMA has such a different character than the State Road 44. And so the intent is to that to be more of a service providing type exit. In other words, you're coming home from work because there's going to be a lot more residential in that area, and you're going to want to go to the grocery store. So that grocery store requires eight to 10 acres for the grocery store with two out parcels. And those out parcels can be a gas station or a fast food or something like that. So that's the kind of development that is envisioned for Cardinal Street. And that is a typical requirement for that type of shopping center development. Now the gentleman's absolutely correct for the freestanding um, gas stations of today, you're looking at a, an acre and a half to three acres. That's spot development, and I don't think that was the intent for Cardinal Street. Okay. Does that help? Okay. Good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <coughs> All right. With that, um, since there's no other parent comment from the public, we can move on to 44. 44. I will, I get to do 44. Okay, so let's see. So um, that's coming up. So yeah, so with State Road 44, as I said earlier, now what we're talking about today is just, is the comprehensive plan. So it's much more general. It's not specific yet. We're, we're still at the high level with the comprehensive plan, providing the, the, the overall um, standards and requirements, but not the details at this point. So with State Road 44, um, before my slides, I can go through them real quick. Sure, give me just one yeah. second. Be oh, yes, ma'am. That's okay. So in terms of how we got here, very similar to what Amanda already said, so I won't go over it. We had the TBRPC. The difference is now we're going right to the comp plan. We don't have that other piece. So that, that's why we're here today. So Amanda already told you the bigger story. Don't need to go through that. In terms of State Road 44, oh, and there it is. Thank you. Sorry about Thank that. you. Not a problem. All right. Background line. We just did that one again. I just said that. So this is the boundary. This is what was provided to us uh, by the county as part of this analysis. Um, so it has not changed at this point, um, but I will say this is the comp plan. It hasn't been established yet. Um, unlike Cardinal that's already adopted in your co conference plan, that boundary, this has not been. So you know, this is open for potential discussion if that's something that's desired to be done. But that is the boundary. You can see it. Um, this particular aerial doesn't show the connection to it, um, but it is, you know, the Suncoast does connect to that area. And by and large, you can see it's the properties on, on either side of 44 um, and extending on both sides of, of the, the interchange. So that is the boundary. Um, as, as Lynn said, and, and I'm sure you all know, State Road 44 is a much different. I'm going to go back here. Is much different. I'm sorry, folks. I don't know your slide. Do you want me to put it? To yes, ma'am. So, so, no, so State Road 44 is a much different corridor than Cardinal. So, state, as you all know, State Road 44 is a major state highway. Uh, it goes coast to coast. Just 
for your information, I previously was the planning director for Sumter County. Um, so I dealt with State Road 44 quite a bit in going through Sumter County. Um, with, with Also with State Road 44 being part of the strategic intermodal system of the state, it gives that, that higher importance of economic development because it's a very important part of this overall network for the state of Florida for goods movements, people movements, and, and making sure things get from where they need to go, get things to where they need to go. So 44 is a different animal than we have in Cardinal. Oh, thank you. So that, that is a little bit on the background there. So in terms of public engagement, um, same as what Amanda said, we have another separate website now for State Road 44. And we'll make sure everybody knows that before we leave today, what those websites are. They're active, they're open, people can go on today, tomorrow, anytime. We have polls, that's where these come from, that you can respond to, you can submit comments, and as we projects begin to get developed, they will be posted there for people to see. But unlike we had in Cardinal, the folks that responded here on 44, you know, they were um, very supportive of the idea, not everybody, but it was a little bit you know, more supportive of change to happen within this corridor related to the opportunities that are coming with the Sun Coast. Again, not everybody, though there's still folks out there, understandably, that are concerned. Um, in terms of the priorities, the interesting thing, it's not too much different than what Amanda said on Cardinal. It's just we're talking about a different scale, different kind of location. But you know, the physical characteristics, as we talked earlier, how things look, how they're developed, as came out as the number one priority so far. You know, being consistent with the character of the community. <coughs> and now here, those job opportunities, you know, more commercial opportunities, um, and then improved mobility and safety with the roadway, and then, um, and then also expanding housing options within this area. So again, very, you know, so here we got a little bit more broad in terms of the, the, the desires for this community. The type of development, I won't go through all those, but you can see them there. Again, it's, it's very much focused on commercial, um, workforce housing. And I do want to say right now what workforce housing means, at least in terms of how we're working with this, it's, it, it's folks that make 80% of the average median income of Citrus County. Here in Citrus County, what that number is, it's $49,500 a year for a family of four. So that's, that's that 80% AMI, which is kind of that break where you talk about workforce housing. So for a family of four here in Citrus County, based on 2022 numbers from Housing and Urban Development, that's a family of four that makes, that has an income of $49,500 a year. Um, but that's, that's what that means. So those are your, your people. So concern about tra traffic um, and the amenities. And again, we also hear, heard a lot about infrastructure, the importance of making sure we have appropriate infrastructure in this area. In terms of the stakeholder meetings, again, that same night we did Cardinal, we also did uh, 44. Uh, assets and challenges, the, the, you know, the greatest asset is what I already spoke about. This is an SIS facility. There's large high traffic counts in the area. Um, you already have a commercial corridor in that area. You have infrastructure there. And so, so there, there's a lot of positive there in 44 cor corridor to promote future development. In terms of the concerns, though, is making sure that one, taking account for existing entitlements, what people can already do there, make sure we're, we're sensitive to that. Um, having a cohesive vision, so you know this is not, and what I like to say, it doesn't look like US 19 in Pinellas or Pasco County. We don't want that to happen. Um, so have a vision, so we have a good corridor, um, and, and but also allow for the flexibility of uses. Um, and, and there was a concern just about the process to get to get to develop if this were to move forward. So those are some of the challenges here. Um, in terms of the expectations, um, uh, the deeper, less linear, this gets to the idea of trying to encourage more campus-like settings, more kind of cohesive projects as opposed to just strip development along the corridor. Um, having some flexibility in development. Uh, there was some discussion about the boundary and also, there's some properties that are split with zoning districts on there, so to clean that up. Uh, concerns, you know, State Road 44 is a state highway, state roadway. So all access to that, that roadway has to go through permitting through FDOT outside of, you know, the county's control. So that brings FDOT into the picture as projects develop. Doesn't necessarily mean that's bad, just means that's 
something else that has to happen. Um, concerns again about loss of maybe commercial entitlements that may already be out there, again, the PUD. And, and also there was a question, and, and uh, Lynn can speak more to it if you'd like, is just, is this the right time now to do this or is it some time later in the future? Those are some concerns that were raised. The development pattern here, now we're talking a little bit more high density, um, potentially for the residential, but again, concern about good design and it's a positive development and ultimately it is a gateway to Citrus County. Um, and I can tell you when I was in Sumter, I knew when I got to Citrus, just coming across. There was a change. So it is a gateway to your county. Um, again, having good design again, and, and also you know, try to have the businesses where they're the things that people see, not big parking lots when they come down the road. You know, again, this is what, what we heard through the stakeholder meeting. Um, and most importantly, again, don't lose the nature coast. Don't lose the character of what, what Citrus County is. The public. Very similar, as Amanda said. Um, we held that one, the Realtors Association. We had 25 folks attend that meeting. So what the, the general public saw, the, the assets for this corridor is, again, there's some large parcels there. Um, they saw, you know, it's kind of low, medium density, kind of residential in the area. They recognized the, the natural areas that are around there. And the folks there believed it was a quiet rural character. That's what the public thought. In terms of their challenges, um, they thought there was too many gas stations. They wanted more diversity of businesses and opportunities that are out there. Um, some, the issue of septic came up and folks at that meeting wanted to keep their septic um, at that meeting. And again, concern about the traffic on State Road 44. Expectations, I would say, are the same that they had, that, that our stakeholders had. They want good design, good development. They want to have essential services and opportunities for employment and jobs. That's very similar to what our stakeholders said in terms of their concerns. Very similar to what our stakeholders said again. Concern about the traffic and the access management with that roadway. The entitlements um, and making sure housing and development there is compatible. Uh, and public safety, you know, uh, the sheriff, law enforcement, fire, EMS, all those good things. Making sure your schools have a sufficient capacity. And avoiding incompatible heavy industrial things that could have a very negative impact potentially. So we did have a nice, I believe, a, a alignment here in terms of what our stakeholders said and who our stakeholders were. I know Amanda didn't say that, but I will tell you generally. Um, the county identified uh, the folks to attend this meeting. Um, it was a cross section of all kinds of folks. Um, we had two speakers here earlier. They were at the meeting. Uh, we had your um, Economic Development Commission folks there. We had the Realtors Association there. We had residents there. Um, they were also invited people, some residents that the county were aware of that were very concerned. They were there. Um, and so it was a very nice cross section of folks that were there. Um, so, we, so we talked to them as folks that really had a very strong knowledge and interest on both of these corridors to get what they thought and then go out now to the general public to get their input. And it's nice where we see where we have a little bit of, they, they agree with each other in some places. So that, that's nice to see. So that's what we heard at the public open house. In terms of the market analysis, and I'll give the overview if you have questions, Lynn can give you more specific. Nothing surprising. Um, there's a good commercial market there um, to support the residential demand that's out there. Um, you know, you've got this residential development that's occurring and it's coming. Um, as you said, sir, the Florida is growing and they're coming here. So we need to make sure we make sure it comes in here the way we want it to come here. That we want to say this, we want good development to protect the county and the quality of life here. Um, you know, development here ties in your, with your strategic plan, plan here for the county for economic development. So that's a, why, a good thing to encourage this area to, to build. <coughs> it's a gateway, we already talked about that. Um, as these areas develop, particularly if, if they have a, you know, a campus-like setting, provide opportunities for um, public gathering spaces, amenities, things that give State Road 44 a character other than there's just a bunch of businesses there along that strip. And finally, opportunities for mixed use between residential and, and non-residential, commercial, industrial office, whatever that is. Um, so that's from a market those are the main pieces that we see for State Road 44. But it is a very strong area that has a lot of interest 
for development. Lynn can tell you more about that if you'd like, but, but the, I don't know, I'm sure nobody's surprised about that. In terms of the comprehensive land amendment, as I said, this is much very high level. So the details that you saw with Cardinal, we're not there with this one yet. We're still at, at the higher level. So in terms of what the objective was, and this is what our marching orders were coming in here, was the objective of this comprehensive plan. As we just said, as we saw with the feedback we received, we want to promote compact and nonlinear development along 44, where it's appropriate to mixed use residential and non-residential, absolutely promote economic development within this corridor, because this is a prime economic development corridor. Similar implementation that we heard in, in Cardinal would be the same here. If, a, if an applicant goes to, impl goes to develop and implement this district, they would go through the future land use map amendment and the PUD. A very important point, Amanda spoke about it, it's also here. The way Cardinal is structured and the way this comprehensive plan amendment is structured, we are not requiring anybody to change or to do anything different than what they can already do on the property. So if they have a property and it's a lot of record, it's already there, meaning it's already there prior to these regulations getting adopted, if they get adopted, um, they still can develop as if this didn't exist. Now where it triggers them is now when they come to the county to now split out the property or create a new lot of record. So go to do a subdivision or create, you know, out parcels or things like that. That would then trigger the requirements. But if you have a two acre, you know, general commercial zoning on your property and you want to sell it and the person that buys it wants to build on that two acre general commercial, as is, they can do it under the current county codes and requirements. There's no requirement. So just because you're going to develop doesn't necessarily mean you have to do this implementation. The trigger is if you begin to separate and split out your properties, that's when this gets triggered. Because we are very sensitive to, especially in this quarter with all the commercial zoning that's already there and those entitlements. So we're not taking those away. If you, you have what you have, you still have it, there's a trigger when it would come in. So that's, that's how this policy is set up. We, we, we are fortunate in this case, I believe, is because the comp plan has not been done yet. So issues like the parcel size and things like that, you know, they're not established. If, if the county's not comfortable with what we're recommending, we can absolutely change it now because there's nothing's been adopted yet for this corridor. So that's the objective. In terms of, I'm not gonna go through this. So we were, it was important. What we heard was identifying permitted and prohibited uses. Permitted uses are pretty broad. They're things that the market study supports. Again, it's light industrial manufacturing, the technology, research development. Also allowing for some residential, single and, female, single and multifamily, the commercial, and you know, the, the things you would expect in commercial. Um, what we heard was probably more important was what was prohibited there because of the desire to make this a very viable and, and good corridor for the county was getting, basically prohibiting the, these pretty high impact um, industrial type uses. One exception is low density residential. Um, this, the way this is being structured, you could not do a, a single family, a single family subdivision at four units per acre. That, that would not be, that is prohibited as, as how this is currently structured. So those are permitted and prohibited uses. Um, we do recognize that we can't list every single use that's out there. So there is a provision that says if it's not permitted, then it's prohibited. Um, but we've spelled out very specific ones that we knew were, at least the feedback that we had gotten to this point were very important. In terms of the guidelines, there's 12 policies that are in there. I'm not gonna go through them, but I'm gonna tell you what they say. So in terms of the minimum parcel size, um, the eight and 18 doesn't work here. It's too big, it doesn't, doesn't work. We, we actually did a parcel size analysis. We looked at the parcelization along this corridor to see what it was. And that's how we got to the five. Um, how we got to the five was when we looked at that, we looked at how many parcels were less than, I had to, we did it less than five acres. There aren't a whole lot. There, there's, there's some, but it, it's not the majority. The other thing that we looked at then, of those that aren't five acres, is there a potential for an aggregation to occur or not? And it, 
by and large, there is. I'm not saying they have to necessarily, depending on what they're doing, but, but there is that opportunity. So that's how we got to the five. Um, when we, we also went down to three. The issue that we ran into went down to three. Those aggregation possibilities were not nearly as ready, not nearly as available if we st stuck at the five. So that's how we got to the five. We didn't pick a number out of the air. Um, we actually looked at the parcelization and said that number made sense for the, for the purpose of what this amendment is doing. So it's five acres. The other important difference here compared to Cardinal is we do not have two separate areas. So State Road 44, we just have the State Road 44 IMA area or mixed use area. We do not have an EDTA and a mixed use area. We have one area from the interchange on either side to the end of the, the corridor. That's important here because this is different. This is a different corridor and it didn't, it made, we didn't want to say that, well, we really want to only focus commercial right there around the interchange. And then everything else is going to be that way. Just a question. Yes, why do you, why is it important that the county dictate or regulate the minimal parcel size? It, the, the, the importance is because of the way this is, has been brought forward and structured is the idea is to, to avoid this like single lot development pattern that happens. So as, as Lynn said, is to encourage development that is more coordinated, have maybe a more better mix of uses, or in this case, have maybe some, some more larger non-residential facilities, whether it's a research facility, medical facility, whatever that is. So, so that, that minimum parcel size, it's also important because under you know, comprehensive planning, we have to set a minimum, or a ma actually not a minimum, we have to set a maximum um, development potential. So we, we, it's important to set a, a parcel size. Um, again, that number, that's how, how we got to it. It could be a different number if the what county- What percentage of land it. is vacant in this IMA? How much is developed? Vacant. Oh, how much is vacant? I can't tell you an actual number or off the top of my head. Um, but, 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 but there's the opportunities there. So, all right. So, in the mix of, so mix of uses is another important part and a very important difference between this and Cardinal. For this area, we are not saying that you have to do a mixed use if you're non residential because we recognize this corridor will probably have a very strong attraction for users, um, whether a wide variety of non-residential users, that it, it doesn't make sense to make them do that because they want to be there. But if it goes the other way, if a residential person, developer wants to come in, what, we're, what, this, what you have before you says, a residential project has to include a mixed use. They have to bring in a residential or a commercial or office with them. So the way this is structured that you have before you is non-residential of, of those permitted uses. They don't have to have residential with them. They can develop, they still have to meet the different design standards in terms of setbacks and, and open space and all that, that would get developed later, not here in the comp plan but they can develop on their own. Now, the other thing that we're doing though, we're also providing an incentive. If a non-residential user comes in and they do provide residential as part of their project, then we give them the opportunity to bump up their, their intensity, their floor area ratio. Right now it's set at a maximum of one. If they bring in with residential with them, then, we'll, then they can go up to 1.5 1, 1. so they can have more of what they're their non-residential is doing. So that's how this is structured. A non-residential -resi does not have to have residential. If they do have residential, they actually get, get an incentive to do that. Um, residential has to have non-residential with them. So if residential comes in, what we what's being established here also is a minimum density of 12 dwelling units per acre. That gets to the objective saying no low density residential. So what happens with that 12 unit density, units per acre, you're not gonna have you know, detached single family units within this corridor. You'll, you can have you know, attached townhomes, you can have you know, all kinds of other types of housing opportunities, but at a 12 DU per acre, most likely you're not gonna have detached single family, which 
you know, as we look at this corridor and development within that defined boundary, that is probably the more appropriate in relation to the non, non residential uses that would be attracted there. We then provide a maximum density for residential, oh, I'm sorry, I had to do this to you, of 20 dwelling units per acre. But that one we, say, we have in there a criteria. And what we say or what we're recommending is there's three criteria. You don't have to meet all three, but if you can meet one of those three, then on your residential density, you can get to a maximum of 20 dwelling units per acre. So one of the criteria potentially is providing some affordable housing or workforce work work housing, a minimum of 10%. And that's that 80% AMI, AMI number that I spoke to you earlier, because that's why I brought that up earlier. Um, so they could do that. They don't have to do that, but they could do that to get to that density bonus. Um, the other thing they could do as part of their development plan, if they show that they're restoring some, if they're on a property that has some kind of historic or cultural, more likely it'll be some environmental, you know, resource on that property that is that they are protecting and preserving and improving. Uh, that could be a reason to allow for that additional density because they're providing for that that protection of an important resource for the county. And the last one potentially they could do, as, as we talked about earlier, is as part of their develop, development, if they provide a public gathering space, uh, uh, an area that provides an identity for their development for the county, for the community within there. It could be you know, a, a, a green space, a, 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 a entertainment space, you know, something like that. Something that creates a sense of place. Now again, not everybody would be able to do this. This would be on a larger project. But that's an opportunity. Somebody, you know, a developer could come in and say, well, we're going to you know, dedicate this park space that's, that's this green space for people to come and, and gather. So if they do just one, they don't have to do all three, they could get to that higher. And the non-residential intensity, as I already said, it's one and 1.5 if it's residential, if they bring in residential. So that's what's in your policies. Uh, just generally now about the other pieces of it, nothing exciting here. It's, you know, the pattern, this is an economic activity center. We're going to have some centers with mixed uses, you know, the compact development, placemaking. We want to, we want to encourage a variety of spaces and gathering places within this area. The uses, you know, where, where it's appropriate, where it can happen to have this mix of uses. So at least internal to development, you can have pedestrian between the different uses where we do have that opportunity. Um, providing for the diversity of housing types here. Again, getting away, we just don't want to see all detached single family. Circulation and strategic intermodal, these are two very important ones, particularly here with this being State Road 44. And we got to be very cognizant of the safety issue with traffic, very cognizant of how we accommodate transit, walking, and bicycling potentially in the future. And then that's reverse frontage road comment goes with your strategic, strategic intermodal system because FDOT has the access management requirements that will have to be met for development on that corridor and that's a, a not an unusual requirement in corridors like this. So that's a very important component for projects that move forward here is the road. Not only just the capacity of the roadway but really the, the operation part of it and the coordination with FDOT as development move for, moves forward here. Um, same as in Cardinal, uh, the requirement to connect the water and sewer, central water and sewer. And this one actually says we also encourage you to connect to gray water if it's available, uh, reclaimed water. And we also have requirements, uh, just a general requirement that said there needs to be appropriate buffering, particularly with these residential areas that, that abut here to this area to make sure we minimize visual impacts to those residential areas and also to, to make the area look better highway beautification so these these are the, the policies so that's the overview of the policies and what's being proposed again since this is a comprehensive plan part of this process if there's concerns about parcel size or other things we can address those with this process I'd be happy to try to answer any questions you have thank you any questions or comments from anyone yes yes ma'am Will there be aesthetic standards in this IMA also? I must have missed that in the discussion around Cardinal, but I don't see it here either. Right, because here we don't do it in the, in the um, comprehensive plan. So when we come back 
and develop the land development code where there'll be aesthetics. I, my thought will be there will be some, but because this is such a com non-commercially focused corridor, I don't know to the level, I don't think it'll be quite as detailed. But I think there will be some, but I don't think it'll be quite as established. It, yes, ma'am. Any other comments? I yes. Have two questions. One was about the traffic on 44. With all this taken into account, it does not appear that 44 is wide enough at this point. Uh, no, yes, no, absolutely. So, yes, we did not do a traffic study at this point. So what would happen if a development comes through with this? They, they're the ones that do the land use amendment to implement it. They would then be required to do the traffic study and the traffic analysis to determine what kind of improvements would be needed or not needed for that project related to that that corridor. Um, so it's but but no, we did not do a traffic study. Um, it will be it will be done, and that's the other part of FDOT. With this being part of the strategic intermodal system, I will I can tell you DOT is very sensitive to the capacity and congestion on this roadway. Um, again, I hate to say this, but I just, there's a amendment in Sumter County on 44 that DOT actually objected to, which nobody does that anymore because that project was gonna put 40,000 trips, additional trips on State Road 44. So it will be something that would be addressed. At this part of it is, no, we don't do that detailed analysis to say, well, it needs to be six or eight lanes or whatever, or, or stay at four, whatever it is. But when you're doing setbacks and things, you're not necessarily leaving enough room. To right, so in the comp right plan, we haven't established setbacks on State Road 44. So the comprehensive plan, we don't get to that level of detail yet. When we do that land development code, that will be something we'll need to look at. Well, if there's a potential for that right of way to go X amount, put that into consideration. The way your code currently does it is a lot of times you're gonna measure that setback from the center line. So really, uh, and then you also had that's your curve. So that will be addressed in the land development code about how those setbacks would interface with State Road 44 right of way if it were to be widened. In the but comp plan, we don't do that. It after it's too late. No, because because if the comp plan is, you can't do the comp plan until you get the land development code Im implemented and those other the specific design standards, because these standards are more general and broad, they're not specific, and that's the way a comprehensive plan works. When you adopt it, then you adopt the land, which is what's happening here in Cardinal. You then do the land development code, and now you get the specific setbacks and the specific height standards and all those very specific kind of pieces and parts okay, of then, it. Then to go back to Cardinal, when you're talking about the 75 and, and the 50, have you taken into account that Cardinal might need to be widened? It is going to be widened. Yeah. No, so it was based on the existing right of way. It was based on their so existing already, right of way. So we're already past that point, and you're still talking about the 75 and the 50, so it's not going to work. The, 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 well, it will. I, well, well, we'll go back and we'll look at that. I shouldn't say it will. We'll, we'll go back and we'll absolutely take a look at that again. I believe it will. I believe it, it will work. Because, again, we have a very two different, very <laughs> different corridors between Cardinal and 44. Um, now, depending on what happens on Cardinal, that absolutely could get triggered to have to get improved. No, not gonna, um, but we'll look at that. We'll look at that and say, if this were to get widened, how does that change that 75 and 50 in Cardinal? And then we'll, we'll actually look at here in 44 as well now. And as if a I, total layman, it seems to me that it already should have been looked at, and it should have been more than 75 and 50 to start with, because it absolutely will have to be widened along. Yeah. And this is just a layman talking. Yeah. Joe? Yeah, I was going to say, so So with this being a comprehensive plan amendment for State Road 44, we do have to send it to the state for comment. So once we get this to the point where we're ready to actually start adopting it and get state input, DOT, since they're the, the managing agency of State Road 44, will have input on their facility. So. Before okay, this gets approved by... Then I have a question. Didn't um, DOT look at the widening of 491 and 44 when we did it? 
and they've already made a mistake because it's already too narrow. I, I can't speak to the widening of 491 and 44. I'm not familiar with that. And if you look at the what, what's going to happen at 491 and 486, and that's already going to be too narrow. Uh, I don't believe either one of those are state roadways. So those are both county roads. County roads. County roads, right. 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 <sighs> so, but the state, with this application, I just want to make sure everybody is clear that the state will have... <clears throat> excuse me, will have input on this prior to any adoption. Right. So, you know, right. it does go to them. They are going to comment on it. So. Right. Right. Okay. It's just, it, absolutely. So what would happen is, say, if the Board of County Commissioner, what do they call it the transmittal, this will basically get the draft. That gets sent to all the state agencies, including FDOT. They then will, and I will be very certain they'll provide some type of comment on it because it is an important roadway within their system and we'll get that and, and quite honestly we'll reach out to FTOT even before we send anything to them because we want to avoid getting a terrible comment back to the county we want to be proactive to address any concerns that they may have before it gets to that point okay and I have one more question yes ma'am completely different um, on both 44 and Cardinal you have one page that says capital and on 44 it's page 25 and you have a graph, and I can't figure out what it actually means. <coughs> it has orange, gray, blue, but it doesn't tell you what they mean. Oh, well, that's, that's, that's your special report. Okay. That's our okay. Well, okay. well hmm. Lynn's looking that up and preparing to respond. I just wanted to add something to the question about the Cardinal Street setbacks. So what we've done is we've actually um, incorporated the setback standards that are already in the land development code for Cardinal. So those would actually apply on, in the Cardinal area as well. And then we've just clarified that we're applying those street center line setbacks also. So um, Joe, I'm not sure which section it is because I don't have it in front of me, but um, we have applied chapter two, section 2300 and chapter three, section 3740 and section 3745 and in those um, I believe are the uh, setback standards that apply generally and in the county and then that's what we're applying to this area so there's nothing um, I guess what I'm trying to say is that there are setbacks from the property line also that are being applied here it's not just the center line that's what I'm trying to, to right. say right and mm -hmm. the section yeah. 2300 in our land development code has our current setbacks based on classification of roadway not mm -hmm. necessarily width mm -hmm. so that's where you see which uh, you actually saw one earlier today the mm -hmm. classification of state road 200 is principal arterial 125 mm -hmm. foot setback from the center line Mm -hmm. So basically what they had put in there was what we already have in that section 2300. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so it's based on, on classification of roadway, not necessarily the width of the roadway. Mm -hmm. and, and with that comment, though, I think we do need to go back and make sure that's very clear in here because of the question. I think we need to make sure it's more clearly stated in here. So I really appreciate that comment because that helps us go back and refine this so that it's clear to everyone who's looking at it. Thank you. I'll try to answer your question. Um, we break the mar market analysis usually into land, labor, capital, and markets. And so when we look at the capital market, what we're looking at are, is what capital is available for the market to develop, okay? So I'm not sure, what, like one of the reports had a graph and the other one does not. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I'm looking at the graph, and the graph has orange, it has gray, it has blue but it doesn't tell you what anything means. Let me get back to you on that one because I don't have that one pulled up right now, but I think I know exactly what you're talking about and the um, legend for the um, illustration may have been cut off. I think that's what happened on that one. Okay, and there's all of the legends. Sorry, I apologize. Out. They are? All of them, yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll because get that it's fixed. Not in any of the others either, so that's why I just, I'm looking at it and trying to figure out what does it mean. Thank you. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? Any comments from the public? We flipped the.
point, guess and I, and I lost, so I go first. I thought the young lady should have gone ahead of you, though. I, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Only kidding. Um, first off, I received these materials early this week, and accordingly, I've had not a time to really get into a dumpster dive here, Rodham, if you will, and so my thoughts may be a bit random. All right, and my first question to you is, I don't know what you have in your backup material, but um, on February 22nd, I, I sent some detailed stuff to Mr. Sherman and Ms. Catu about this particular application, and then after the meetings, uh, I sent the same material. I have that material for you, um, and it, specifically so you know, if I can get the, the, the area map. Okay, I have three clients in this particular area, okay? One is currently abutting the proposed area and two are directly in it. Um, the Tibbetts Trust parcel is just to the west of the intersection. It is 30 acres of GNC and within the last two to three years, I wanna say, uh, this board and the Board of County Commissioners changed that from PSO into GNC. Uh, I also represent Mr. Kane, Ace Hardware and Home Assassin. He has the piece immediately to the west of the Tibbetts parcel. That's uh, a PSO piece, and that's approximately, I think, eight acres. And then I represent Mr. Morton, who has about 18 acres that abuts, is it Crystal Glen? Oaks. Oaks. Crystal Oaks, Oaks. thank you. Uh, that is low density residential. And the very first thing uh, my comments were is the current IMA in your uh, comp plan is very linear. Uh, and one of the things that was good about Cardinal was it had added depth. And when you add depth, you avoid strip type commercial land uses. And God knows we have plenty of that already in Citrus County based on the fact that for years we've always had 400 feet of depth of commercial on arterial roads. And you know that. So my proposal, uh, and I'm going to give this to you, was to, to add the Morton piece in because I thought it would fit well for high-density residential use and then add some parcels on the uh, north side of the northeast side of the Duke uh, power line. And those parcels are currently MDR, which has an element of higher density but it also has uh, an element of commercial. And the reason for that is I thought that that gave us a much better area to, to deal with as far as the land uses. Now, the, you posed the question to me, how do you get to the parcels across that Duke power line? And one of the things they will give you a permit to do is put a road underneath it, okay? We've asked them in the past to put stormwater drainage in those power lines, thinking, what a great use underneath the power line. But that's unilaterally been rejected. Uh, and I think it's been rejected a lot because of national security concerns, not the fact that they didn't like drainage. But they do allow roads. So that, that's our very first thought process here is to try to add some depth to the IMA area to allow a, a greater flexibility of uses. Those MDR parcels, when, when that road gets built around it, it's kind of residential, but it's not gonna be residential at all. And if there's any area in the IMA that might have some uh, light industrial uses, it would be that area, and it's all just pasture. So, moving along, the, um, when I went, th went through this, I'm just gonna give you some very specific comments and I'll follow them up in writing. Um, I don't believe you want to permit single family residential in this district. Now it talks about there'll be no low density residential, but I really don't think you want one lot to be built and have a house in it in the middle of what we're trying to do here. So I would ask that you might want to take a look at that policy. Um, perhaps it might be best in your permitted uses if you cite to uh, the districts that we have so that everyone is familiar with them, medium density, high density residential. The prohibited uses, um, the one that stood out at me that's not there is adult entertainment. I think we might all agree on that one. 
it's not really if this is the gateway to the community, I think that's appropriate. It's not, you're not gonna violate anyone's constitutional standards. Um, the one that I have a, a severe question about is the tip, it's parcel, 30 acres. Um, in the material I'm gonna give you, we had some conceptual master site plans we had done on that with shared drainage. We also have uh, some uh, work product that Mr. Gibbs did as far as pedestrian design and other designs and open space designs. Um, but that piece is, isn't going to be built on 30 acres, one lot of record. So they're going to have to subdivide. And that subdivision, according to what you're telling me, triggers this. But when I read uh, your policy, I'll give you the number here. 17XX2, it talks about us being developed consistent with permitted lot sizes. But then the next sentence says, if we do this, then we've got to comply, which would bring us down to a minimum or maximum of five acres. So you may have an internal inconsistency within your policy that you need to address there. Um, and as, as we all know, under Rule 9J5, that's I don't know. <laughs> yeah. The five acres, um, I really think it needs to be brought down, okay? I give you some information on what a, the Wawa are built on. The fact of the matter is that's going to be one of the type of uses you'll see here. Um, you ought to be glad it's not a Bucky's, <laughs> if you, in case you've ever been to one. Uh, and so uh, I don't think it's going to, and let me say this, in 1990, this strip of land, it wasn't designated GNC all up and down this roadway. It was all PSO. What they did in the maps in 90 was from uh, the power company on the south side of the road all the way around out to what I'll call Cowboy Junction. Okay, if you lived here a while, you know where that is? It was all PSO. And they did that because it was out in the country and they didn't think it was, quote, ready for GNC. Now we got a major highway there. That area, those PSO lots are ready for GNC and they should be GNC. So that you, we should, in, in my approach that I submitted, we took a, a tiered approach. Those lots right on the highway, we put them in GNC high intensity type uses. Those that didn't have access to the highway we backed off and said those should be PSO, multifamily, perhaps uh, light industrial. So that was the approach we took. Uh, I think that lot size issue is gonna be problematic. Gaston's already told you about the issues down in Cardinal because of the lot size, and we don't need to make the same mistake. But again, we don't wanna get into this piecemeal type stuff. And, and then that goes to some of the things I discussed in my memorandum about joint driveways, shared drainage, uh, sign standards, uh, open space standards, uh, and incentivizing perhaps open space for uh, affordable housing. Uh, and then on this, by the same token, uh, taking that 70% ISR and bringing it back down to something like 50% will do a world of good for aesthetic visual things, much more than your, your, your buffers do, trust me on this that open space requirement, just grass, goes a lot further along the way than uh, a buffer will. Um, so, and then uh, the um, idea that you cannot just have freestanding residential without a mixed use, I haven't f thought that through, but on the Morton piece, which is the 18 acres, which is right there on the corner, kind of got commercial to the front of it already, kind of got residential, okay? <coughs> it's the perfect piece for uh, multifamily, but you wouldn't put multifamily there with something else because the something else, the mixed use, the office or the commercial has no roof signage and the people couldn't get there. So that criteria becomes very problematic. And I, I've been telling Mr. Morton here for two years, you need to hang around and get in the IMA 
right now. I think I'm going to go back in my office and tell them to get out, <laughs> frankly, <laughs> uh, if this were to go through. So uh, those are my thoughts. I, I want to talk to you about traffic. You asked the question, okay. If you read the traffic studies that were done for the Suncoast Parkway, it's remarkable what they say. You're talking, they talk about in the year 1945, 55,000 cars on State Road 44. That's FDOT study. By the same token, on Suncoast Parkway south of 44, they're talking about 15 to 20,000 cars, and it drops off to 12,000 to 15,000 if you go north. So what FDOT in the traffic studies tell me is the generator here, the traffic, yeah, there's going to be a lot on that turnpike, but that turnpike's designed for 20,000 cars. On State Road 44, we're going to have a lot more traffic, a uh, lot more than there is now, and there's about 22,000 cars per day going both ways in this area. So um, this is very random on my part. Again, just to summarize, I think you need to look at expanding it out maybe adding more land, which provides greater opportunity in a void strip. Uh, the minimum lot size is certainly problematic. I don't know anybody in Citrus County that's done 12 units per acre, okay? I do know this, if you're talking about workforce housing, the criteria is, uh, is it how proximate, I'm talking about tax-funded workforce housing. The criteria is schools, medical, walkability and commercial development and this area this IMA lacks all of that they have none of the criteria and if you look at those tax credited projects in Citrus County they're directly abutting to commercial schools medical one in Beverly Hills one in Citrus Hills uh, meet all those criteria so Getting workforce housing, it's not being done by private developers. It's either been like the Catholic Church or tax credited. And this would be a very difficult area to do that. So you, that minimum of 12 acres could prevent, uh, I'm not going to call it workforce housing, but it could prevent multifamily units coming in at an area that could use multifamily units. So maybe you give a range, 8 to 12 something okay and I'll follow this up and write and I appreciate the time and more than three minutes mr. chairman thank you <laughs> you're quite welcome sir <laughs> anyone else wishing to speak on the uh, 44 interchange yes it's kind of on everything I have an expression of gratitude I'm Christine Alfonso I'm with Kaiser's International working with developers in the area on collaborating on Cardinal Street. I'm a commercial property owner on Cardinal Street and working to bring in investors and businesses, particularly to Cardinal and Citrus County. And I just wanted to say thank you to the commission, to um, Wade Trim, and also to RMA for all of the information that they've shared with us to help guide those efforts. Very, very much appreciate it. And I'd like to extend an invitation to consider my experience in my career has been in tourism development. And you've got an ideal welcome center with the Cardinal Interchange to welcome tourists to Citrus County. Uh, you're just one hour from the Tampa Airport, and I just envision that as, a, as the gateway to Citrus County for tourists coming to the area. And a consideration, and again, a thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak? Gaston Hall representing the Citrus County Building Alliance. Uh, have a question. Are the 12 policies all you're going to be adopting at this point? Yes, sir. That, that, well, that's what's proposed at this point, yes, sir. So where in the 12 policies does it say that you don't have to have two uses for commercial? It says it actually. In the, in the adopted it's policies? It's, well, the objection gets adopted as well, too, sir. So you're, you're objecting the guidelines? I read it in the guidelines. I just didn't see it in the policy. No, no, it, it's actually part of this as well. And it'd be, we can put it in the policy as well, but it, it's there, but we okay. can put it in the policy as well. I started to say, from the past, 
if it's not in the policies, if it's just a guideline or if it's just a something like that, somewhere down the line it's going to get dropped or it's going to get overlooked and are going to say, well, it was never really adopted as a policy or a requirement. So to me, it's critical that when you talk about any of these items that are in here that are listed, whether it's two land uses or one land use, whether it's five acres, whether it's 12 units, make sure everything that's in here gets adopted in a policy, not just a guideline or down the road, it won't be there. We already talked to you about the restaurant chains and all this stuff, not, uh, not needing five acres. Um, some of them don't even need three acres, but three acres will get you down in the range where a lot of the national chains will build. Five acres, they're just gonna have leftover land. It's just gonna be a detriment to, to require that much. The, I'll go back and talk about the gray water lines for future service. I know it's in our comp plan, but it's really a, a waste. Time and again, we see all these gray lines put in, and then when they actually get ready to use them, they can't use them, they tear them up out of the ground, have to move them, have to change the size of them, you name it. It's just when you put in st stuff in the future that you don't have a use for right then, or you don't know where the water's coming from or where it's going to, it's just wasting money requiring to put all that piping in the ground. Um, 44, we talk about the beautification. I just want to make sure that we don't get it mixed up with we have a F dot requirement, we have a county requirement, and they conflict. The last thing I want to do is to go apply for a F dot driveway permit, and the county says you have to do this, and F dot says, no, you can't do that, you have to do this. So I just want to make sure whenever we get ready to put a policy in about this, that there is absolutely no gray area between beautification required by F dot and those required by county ordinance. And don't forget, once you put it in a policy, you're asking, can any items be changed by doing a PD or PUD? If it's a comp plan policy, it cannot. Only your LDC rules and regs can be changed through that. So make, whenever you go to do a policy, when you're putting it in the comp plan, be more cognizant of what that requirement's gonna be and what it's gonna take to change it in the future. And like I say, just make sure that we're perfectly clear about commercial, doesn't have to have a second use. Thank you very much. Anyone else from the public wishing to speak on either of these? The original, it takes me a while to get there. Seems this is a workshop, you don't need to fill out the yellow form. You don't need to fill out the yellow form. This is just a workshop, so. Oh, okay. All right. Great. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Um, we'll give you three minutes. Only kidding. For the record. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Avis Marie Craig. I'm a planning consultant in this county for many years, and uh, I just finally was able to print this out because of the problems with the clerk's office switch of your uh, access to your uh, agendas and backup so I've only had like uh, less than 24 hours to review this and and so I'm I may well have some other comments as we go but um, a couple of things um, the first has to do with and uh, Mr. Stilwell was describing to you the piece of property owned by Mr. Morton um, I've got an aerial the property parcel reference number on that, and something that wasn't said before. This is technically uh, a part of the Crystal Oaks original PD, and it was known as Phase 5. You may well know about this sort of thing, Mr. <coughs> Bramlett, but, um, and I believe uh, when, when they last amended that PD back in 2000, they did so in anticipation that they were going to sell that piece off um, because they removed some of the prior language which was very detailed about single family lots. And the ordinance actually speaks to just, and it's shown on that master plan from 2000, future residential. And so it was opening the door to broaden what kind of uses might come on the site. And here we are today now 
potentially looking at that very thing. So I'd like to provide that to you so that there's no question as to what property um, we, we were both speaking about. Um, the other thing is because, and assuming that um, it's agreed that it should come into the IMA, um, I think there should be some language embedded into the objective and several of the policies that acknowledge existing PDs um, that would fall within the IMA and that their process would be a little less rigorous, not having to go through a comp plan amendment, but strictly to do an amendment to their PD uh, at the time that they go to develop, uh, acknowledging that that's a pre-planned community and development. Um, a use that um, it may be generically covered here under light industrial, but I think that you want to maybe give some thought to adding um, a permitted use um, in the arena of logistics and warehousing, because very recently Amazon bought a piece off Suncoast down in Hernando County. And so I think you're going to see, not only had they purchased something in Pasco County previously, now they've purchased in Hernando. So I think it's just a matter of time that we're gonna see more and more of um, those kinds of facilities looking for uh, location along the parkway. Um, and other than that, I would reserve future comments once I've had a little more time to review this. Would you like me to give this to staff, or would you like this, or yeah, where? Can we give it to our consultant, please? Yeah, I, can do I will. That. What I'll do, I'll, I'll scan it for you, and I'll send it. Great, thank you. Great. Anyone else wishing to speak on these topics? Great. Any last words from? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I want to say I greatly appreciate all the comments. That's exactly why we were here today. So to hear what you all thought, what your concerns and issues were. So we, we heard them very loud. So that gives us very good direction as well as the folks that spoke today. So what you'll see from us now is now as we move forward, and actually before we go to the Board of County Commissioners, we'll do our best to address as many of these comments that we heard from you all to say, this is what we heard. This is how we'll redress it. And when we go out to the public, we'll get even more feedback. And ultimately, what you'll see coming back will be what they think at the end. So again, I appreciate everything everybody said to us today. And we, we really, really do think it'll help us get to the end of this. And also, at any point, as long as staff's comfortable, we are always open to talk to anybody. Um, you can contact us through the website. It actually, I think it goes to Joanna if you go, but you can reach out to us at any point. Any resident, any property owner, we're more than happy to talk to you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Okay. Joe, any final? Yes, Commissioner Face Mark. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have um, one follow up question. Uh, I know we've tested our uh, limit on uh, our attention spans, <laughs> uh, but I just have a quick question. Um, <coughs> Uh, Mr. Hall and, and Mr. Stillwell both alluded to the fact that um, we should consider uh, making the parcels smaller from three or from five to maybe three. And um, uh, Mr. Hall made reference to there, there could possibly be national uh, developers would be interested in a smaller parcel. Uh, Gaston, can you kind of uh, expand on that a little bit? Who, who might they be, you know, just so we can understand? I mean, virtually the majority of them. I mean, I've built in 38 counties in this state, commercial and residential. And when you get to these national chains, they have a criteria package that is mandated. And they have a few that they may move on. But whether you're down in Coral Springs or whether you're in the Panhandle, Tallahassee, or Jacksonville, Orlando, or here, they have a core requirement that if you can't meet that, they won't build there. And whether it's food change or whether it's fueling places, um, retail areas. When you get to these ones that stand alone, or sometimes like the one we have on 49146, you get a fueling station and a fast food, they have criteria that if, if you can't meet it, they won't do it. So if we come in here and set a comp plan policy or set policies that will not allow them or any, or any of us to meet that criteria, 
they'll just look elsewhere. And I don't think that's what we want to do at this point in time. I think we want the fueling places and the sit-down restaurants to, to come to these locations and build. And we don't want to do anything that would jeopardize anybody being able to bring them here. Because if you ask any anybody that deals in those types of construction or even looking for property for those corporations, they will tell you that. They, they just... So, know, so we're, we're talking... Uh, Wow, Cracker Barrel, um, all those, yeah, all those chains. Um, not, not so much a Target or uh, no, that's a larger retail. No, we're talking about the ones that you know will service more the service. In yeah, type, you know, yeah, right okay. there. If you're coming off that inter, you know, interstate anywhere, you're coming off a turnpike, you know, you're looking for fuel, you're looking for food, you maybe looking for some small retail something, but nothing major like that. Got it. That's a whole yeah. different can of worms. Now you're into a big developer that's going to do a giant like target and then he's going to have outer parcels for the uh or he's going to have connecting units so that that's a different animal okay great thank you but it that, exists that i mean it's out there though too at the same time i mean right. they exist they are out there yeah did have one question uh churches we've got two that are going to be in this ima if they go to expand under the policies that are currently proposed what are those churches going to have to co comply and do in order to make their expansions on it are they going to become non-conforming uses? Uh, Mr. Chair, I could. Uh, Lynn with Economic Dome, she could also address your, your question, Mr. Pacemark, because actually that's something she does. She works with these national chains and helps them identify sites. So, Lynn? You know, it, it, it's Citrus County's um, objective to be a quality place to live. <clears throat> and that's what your objective he here is what you're considering. And so he's, the comments are right, what national retailers and the Wawa's and the Chick-fil-A's and all the great folk places that we all wanna go and those services that you wanna have here. And they will come here. And the less regulations you have, then perhaps they might come a little faster. That's not gonna improve your quality of life. Um, what we're recommending is something that goes a little bit deeper, that does ask you to be a little bit more restrictive on what you're having come into the community. So the old adage that um, retail follows rooftops is still alive. And so those rooftops, the, the quality of life that you're putting here, the tourism, that you have here, the, the wonderful natural assets that you have here are the things that are gonna make people wanna come live here. And then those services are gonna come here because right now you don't have the population and you don't have the incomes to support those type of uses. So to get those higher end uses here, you're gonna to have to raise that population and that population income. So, and you do that with that job creation and maybe I'm getting off the bandwagon a little bit here, but, but that's how you create that. And so you are raising the bar. You are asking the developer to come in at in, in a, a higher standard. Um, I, five acres is, is large. Uh, three acres, you can give some more standards to, I agree, but you're still gonna have that spot development. You're gonna have that, and I've done it. So where, where you have this great big beautiful piece of 20 acres of property and you've got a landowner who all of a sudden's got the, the uh, convenience store gas station that's willing to pay him bukus of money for that corner parcel. And he says, gee, I need the money, I'm gonna sell it. And he does. And then now you've defined what happens to the rest of that parcel of property. You have 100 acres of property available for development in the IMA. I did check it. So there is 100 acres. It's not all in the market, but it, it is available for sale. The average sales price right now is about $45,000 per acre for sales that have occurred over the last couple of years. So that's going to come way, way up. And the way you bring that up is to, to define that development that occurs and to put those guidelines in that, that um, put, put some regulations there that um, raise the bar. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Joe, any 
Final thoughts that, uh, regarding upcoming Sorry, events? I was just going to say that um, if any of the board members, any of the public, anybody wants to provide comments, by all means, you can give it to staff. We'll share it with the consultants. So, you know, if you feel like you don't know how to or can't get a hold of the consultants, by all means, let us know. We'll, we'll share it with them. So. Okay. Thank you very much. Did you want to say something else? Third time's a charm. When we did Cardinal and the, the plan amendments, okay, there's an absolute requirement that Mr. Sherman put in there that within these IMAs, all of the IMAs, uh, the only type of development is PUD. So uh, there's a clause in here about if you do a PUD, you can adjust the lot size. It's already required to be a, a PUD, whether it's an acre or my client's 30 acres or if Mr. Morton's piece came in, uh, it would be required to be a PUD under existing policies, mm. which means you guys have eyeballs on it. And, and this this idea of when someone carves out two acres for the Wawa, and then they carve out an acre for the Chick-fil-A, um, the way you can deal with that, okay, is the smaller the parcel, the lower the ISR, the bigger the parcel, See what I'm saying here? So if you only got an acre, instead of doing 70% ISR, tell them they can only do 50%. That takes away from that um, more open space. And then, but if they do a mixed use, you get incentivize them and maybe you say you can do 80% ISR. Just that's the, that kind of give and take gives greater flexibility to the developers. Uh, and I can also tell you that this road has been being built for the last four years, been open six months. Uh, we have not had one inquiry on Tibbetts Lumber Trust property, the 30 acres, not one, which I find interesting. So. Thank you. And if you want this material I've provided them, I, I, got, I brought copies for you. You can leave I'll a look at it. We can leave a copy with Joe and then Joe, we'll pick them up as we're on our way out. Uh, thank you. Mr. Joe, we, we do have that information from Mr. Steele, so we do have that. Great. Any other comments from the commission? Seeing none, meeting's adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>